biology group icgb new delhi i welcome you all to the international icgb dbt workshop on advanced training in immunology of tuberculosis in this first morning session we have two consecutive scientific lectures by the eminent scientists in the field in that order our first speaker is professor deepak koshal director southwest national primate research center texas biomedical research institute san antonio usa Dr Koshal is recognized for having developed the macaque model of TB using the natural inhalation route of infection and a model of MPB HIV co-infection. Dr Koshal and his research team have made major discoveries about how MPB interact with the primate lungs within the granulomas and have provided fundamental insights into the biology of the pathogen as well as the host environment. In today's lecture he is going to talk about the mechanism of protection from tb by an attenuated whole cell mycobacterium tuberculosis vaccine over to you sir thank you very much for that kind introduction i'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully you can see my slides and if so could you kindly let me know wonderful wonderful thank you very much it's So good morning uh, to all of you today, and it's always a pleasure to to, uh, to talk to the wonderful immunologists and microbiologists that work uh, in India in the field of TB. It's uh, it's a big problem um, um, the world over, especially in India, and it is so good to see such wonderful science uh, in the field of TB uh, occurring over there. So as as uh, was noticed during the introduction, I'll talk about. um the vaccine candidate that you may or may not have heard of uh, but uh, i'll definitely focus on it in the next forty or so minutes um, i don't need to introduce tb to this audience this audience is well versed with the impact of tb um i just wanted to highlight the fact that in the amount of time that i am slated to talk to you uh, today uh, another 200 people will succumb to tb so so the impact is real Uh, and something must be done about it. So I only have one introduction slide, and then we'll delve into the model and the data. Uh, but this slide is important, uh, and you may have seen many iterations of this slide before. Um, you know, this displays the life cycle of my particular tuber process, but it's important for the context of my talk. So, um, as we all know, microtubule tuber process is one of the few. pathogens that are known bona fide to be transmitted via the aerosol via the inhalation route and so uh, people that come in contact that are anti naive that come in contact with infected and diseased people that are uh, transmitting the pathogen the, the gram positive bacillus uh, there is a very intense initial reaction when the bacteria is picked up by allular macrophages in the lining of the lung and this leads to um, a very complex innate immune phase characterized by high levels of cytokine and chemokine secretion uh, and a number of granulocytes predominantly neutrophils innate uh, lymphocytes also um, are recruited to try and control the initial infection and this cascade eventually calls upon uh, adaptive immunity as well uh, three or four weeks later uh, t cells and gene specific t cells both CD4 and CD8 and B cells are also recruited to the granuloma eventually this is a mature granuloma and this granuloma can have many phases and this has been shown in human beings and has been modeled in at least in non human primate uh, model of TB granuloma formation um in in some cases the granuloma can mineralize or calcify and this is believed uh, to er- to eradicate disease but this probably occurs in a minority of cases In the majority of cases, there is an equilibrium which is established, where the bug lies um, dorm, somewhat dormant in the in the core of the granuloma, in the core of the lesion, where it does not replicate or does not replicate nearly as fast enough, um, and therefore there is uh, there is no disease uh, beyond this initial lesion. In some cases, however, the granuloma can fail, as as shown here, and the bug can multiply rapidly. and therefore escape uh, the the uh, constriction of the granuloma and my laboratory 
Murphy, uh, as mentioned earlier, tries to understand these uh, these different conditions and, and what leads to these these conditions using the London Department model. Uh, two things are important. There are two uh, major opportunities for the immune system to uh, effectively restrict the bug. Um, and uh, my lab studies both of them, and I talk about, uh, I focus on the first one here, which is deoxidative first. So the initial phagocytes uh, that are recruited to, uh, to the, site of the initial site of infection, neutrophils and macrophages, um, actually try and restrict uh, this pathogen using classical uh, phagocyte first, uh, which includes the use of uh, FOX um, and uh, nitrosative um, uh, constriction. And it, it works in the case of many pathogens, but not in the case of microbacterial tuberculosis. And then, um, and I'll talk about reasons for that. And then, uh, apologies, the second opportunity is um, for the bug to be restricted in the dormant state in the, in the, in the very developed planinoma because uh, the center of this region where the bug is becomes poorly vascularized blood and therefore oxygen cannot reach the center of this region and therefore uh, and we and others have shown this experimentally the center of this granuloma becomes hypoxic and that can also lead to the killing of many bugs including non-pathogenic microbacteria but because microbacterial tumor process expresses hypoxia response elements uh, which my lab also studies um, it's able to escape both these um, uh, constriction mechanisms. So why do we study TB in monkeys? Um, I'll talk about that in the next few minutes. Uh, but first of all, how do we study this? Um, so we use predominantly Indian rhesus macaques. These are Indian origin, progeny of Indian origin macaques that were brought to the US many years ago in uh, 1977. Um, with the regime change in India, the export of uh, rhesus macaques to the US was stopped, and therefore all of our macaques that we have here are purely uh, uh, captive bred Indian origin rhesus macaques. They are fifth, sixth, seventh, uh, or tenth, up to tenth generation from, from those exports from India. And you can see here this macaque is anesthetized, it's in dorsal recumbents inside a glove box. So this is a class three compartment. Uh, so this is in our DSL three, and we take proper precautions. But ideally, you could actually be wearing street clothes of the type you and I are wearing, uh, and, and just directly work uh, in this environment. You can see here a nebulizer in which desired concentrations of TB are being passed through. This creates an aerosol environment in this head only chamber, and we can expose the bug to desired amounts of bacilli and create the infection or disease. But why do we study TB in macaques? And the, and the reason is shown on this slide. So here I'm showing you gross pathology uh, lungs that were obtained from two different macaques that were infected on the same day uh, with the same dose of the stra same strain of microtune tuberculosis. And the macaque on the left, uh, my left, um, developed uh, signs of clinical TB and had to be humanely euthanized uh, within two to three months after infection. And when we uh, euthanize your pain, which lungs grossly, you can see there is low blood with consolidation of the really bad disease. It's a uh, literal, um, literal it, a, a, a macaque that was infected with the same dose um, of uh, microtuberculosis at the same time, on the other hand, lived the duration of the protocol, which was six months. Did not have to be euthanized for disease. And when you euthanize it for tissue collection, uh, you can see that it has uh, two to three granulomas per row, very contained number of small granulomas, no inflammation, and no work signs of disease. This attack did not make the sample of its bronchial villain large. Repeatedly did not find bacteria in there. Um, by radiography, we don't see um, any work signs of disease. So here is the spectrum of TB disease, ranging from overt uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, where uh, a human being, any cognitive human being, would be transmitting a pathogenic bacilli and, and therefore disease, um, and also um, the other end of the spectrum, the majority of individuals that get exposed to microtune tuberculosis. 
where they are immunologically positive for for uh, infection but have no overt signs of disease. And we actually don't need uh, to dissect out the lungs from these animals to show that the spectrum exists. Now we can just um, in, uh, uh, add um, a radioactive tracers uh, to these animals and, and con conduct PET scans of the type that I'm showing you. And I see um, uh, macaques where there are a defined number of two to three, maybe four in this case, granulomas in the lungs of this macaque versus macaque where almost the entire lung um, is infected with tuberculosis. This is 18 FPG tracing, uh, uh, which, which uh, is essentially glucose and, and whatever there is hyper metabolic activity. By PET CT scanning, by PET scanning, we can identify that. And when we couple this with CT scanning with high resolution, we can find out uh, that there are actually granulomas and hypoxic phase 18 granulomas associated with this inflammation. So this, this, these disparate responses of the spectrum is extremely important um, to study TB in humans. Why uh, you have the left end of the spectrum versus the right end of the spectrum, and we believe that the cats present us the opportunity to, to do that. I'm not going to talk about my NTDHI co infection work. We do that in the lab as well, but macaques are also very good models of NTDHI co infection because they can be co infected with the semen acid, the natural semen immunodeficiency virus, which produces HIV like disease uh, in these macaques. Um, so when we look closely into the granulomas by histopathology of, of those gross lesions that I show you, showed you earlier, the granulomas present like this. They are almost always circular, they're almost always centrally necrotic, as you can see here. And we've shown experimentally that this uh, necrotic region in the center uh, gets depleted in oxygen. You can use probes and tracers to prove that. Uh, this is cornered by um, a light colored layer, which is predominantly uh, interstitial macrophages that arrive in response to oxygen. Uh, in response to infection, and the dark layer on the outside is mostly CD4 cells, some CD8s and B cells, lymphoid layer. So this organization where there are granulocytes in the center and phagocytes that are infected, and this region becomes hypoxic, necrotic, KZH, eventually forms cavities as well in our model, um, bordered by macrophages, bordered by lymphocytes. That order uh, we believe is very important. Uh, this sort of an organization of the granuloma has profound impact on the, the biology of the pathogen, including the restriction of its um, replication, upregulation of hypoxia response elements governed by docile and uh, We've published on that um, extensively. Um, in contrast, most regular mouse models do not present with these highly organized granulomas, as you can see here, and, and really are inflammatory cells uh, that are recruited to the lab. So we believe this, this granular formation is extremely important. And once uh, you can model this, this granuloma effectively, then you can apply uh, not just traditional techniques, um, but also transformative and, and, and modern techniques um, that my lab, uh, in collaboration with others, applies, for example, single cell RNA sequencing of, of the cells that are captured from these granulomas that I just showed you. Uh, we've published uh, this recently, uh, allows us to identify correlates of infection. And, and not just RNA sequencing at the level of single cell, we can now um, actually image the granulomas in a multiplexed manner using this technique that we call, we and our collaborators call, uh, multiplexed ion beam imaging by time of flight. Uh, so essentially, looking at multiplexed confocal type microscopy imaging and tying it with, 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 sight of, uh, with, with the time of flight mechanisms to identify single cell resolution images of, of, of these uh, granulomas. And so the human version of this was published in Nature Immunology by Michael Angelos recently. And in collaboration with him, we are actually imaging macaque granulomas where you, know, you can find granulomas at different times, you don't have to just get granulomas at any stage from people or people that die on, uh, on the road, uh, but you can have a uh, longitudinal collection of granulomas that are isolated in the cats at different times and with treatment, etc., etc., and without treatment. And as shown on this slide, 
we actually have done like a 37 panel antibody panel to image these granulomas that I showed you earlier. And then these can be coughed and therefore signals and data extracted from these granulomas. And this data can then be pseudo-imaged and this actually provides you with an image of the cells with the granuloma architecture that I showed you earlier. And we can identify the different cell types and the different, that are shown here on the slide and the different protein markers that one may be interested in. So my lab has been very interested in indolamine dioxygenase, which is a powerful immunosuppressant of T cell inactivity. And we were the first ones to show that IDO is actually used in this granuloma environment. And we now have a way, which we've published before, to blockade IDO activity and that improves granuloma performance and therefore clearance of TB. And we're able to, just to show you an example, unpublished data, we're able to then identify what cells are significantly recruited to the granulomas once you blockade IDO in these blue monkeys as compared to the controlled black monkeys. And you can see that blockade of IDO actually permits antigen-specific CDA cells to travel to the center of the granuloma. I'm not showing you data, but we have functional data that these CDA cells then go and merge with infected macrophages and actually directly kill them through cellular restriction mechanisms that are governed by the enzyme B. So not going into details of this data because I'm talking about the vaccine work today, but once these granulomas can be modeled, that has led to the development of all of these single cell techniques. So I showed you the two different spectrums. On the left side, you know, red flame, red granulomas, active TB. On the right side, my right side, LTBI with control. And we studied different things in my lab, including pathogen genes that are important for virulence. And we studied vaccines with a number of collaborators, as shown here. And we studied all kinds of vaccines, subunit and vector vaccines. My lab preclinically tested the Pfizer COVID vaccine before it went into human trials two years ago. And therefore, we studied all those kinds of vaccines as well, including mRNA vaccines. But our interest is in either cell-based vaccines, either BCG, that is recombinant or adjuvanted, or MTP that are genetically attenuated to be non-viral, to be avirulent. And then in this model, we study both immunity to a pathology of TB and the role of various immune cells therein. And on the LTBI side, we're interested in antigen-specific responses. What are the antigens that are detected and that are correlated with protection? And as I mentioned, I will not be talking about it, but a large part of my lab studies the co-infection model of MTB and SIV to the potential of developing anti-TB therapies. And we're also interested in perturbation of LTBI, not just with SIV, but with other stimuli, including when we recently become interested in type 2 diabetes. So today, I'll only be talking about the effects on oxidative stress and how we can use that to our advantage in vaccine development. So about 20 years ago, Stuart Cole published the first bacterial genome of microtin tuberculosis. And one thing became very apparent at that point in time, that microtin tuberculosis spent a lot of its genomic currency in modulation or regulation of gene expression. There were significantly higher numbers of transcriptional and translational regulators that were encoded by that genome. And now we know that it's not just traditional transcription factors and translational regulators. There are many different, multiple novel pathways by which expression of proteins can be modulated, both at the level of the message and the protein in this particular pathogen. And that is unsurprising given the life cycle slide that I showed you where the pathogen experiences different biophysical, biochemical, and cellular stress environments. So in these different stress environments, it must modulate itself in order to survive and persist. And we were interested in sigma factors. Sigma factors are bacterial transcription factors that hijack bacterial RNA polymerase so that the regulation, so that the expression of certain gene types, such certain groups of genes known as regulons, can be carried out. And 
um, it was found that microactivity tuberculosis encodes 13 different uh, sigma factors by contrast uh, E. coli encodes 2, CDA and CP. So CDA is, CDA is your uh, regular canonical transcription factor, sigma factor that leads to the transcription of housekeeping genes. CDB is your uh, minor regular sigma factor and then the body encodes 11 other sigma factors, many of them are extra cytoplasmic or alternative. So they respond to extra cytoplasmic signal. And when I left India 22 years ago and joined Bill's lab at Johns Hopkins, I became interested, he and I became interested in uh, sigma H, uh, sigma factor and what it was doing. And we found um, that this particular sigma factor had a very interesting role. So uh, we made, I made a mutation in sigma H and uh, I was disappointed to find that sigma H actually replicated to the same levels in mouse lungs as the white light did. Uh, but uh, interestingly, it did not, the mutant did not have a pathology. So its pathology was significantly reduced as compared to white light. And when I put the gene back in a trans complementation uh, in uh, the L5 uh, change binding part of my potential process genome, where then the pathology came back. So, uh, so we coined this reduced immunopathology phenotype. Bill Jacobs actually uh, wrote an editorial and he coined this term reduced immunopathology. And, and at that point of time, we did not understand uh, the, the full concept, we did not grasp the concept, but it was a very interesting piece of data because still then, virulence and pathology was, was completely tied together. They ran in parallel. So if you uh, stopped the bacteria from growing, pathology went away. Pathology went away, the bacteria had stopped growing. But here we were showing that the two could be uh, dissected separately. And I, when I became independent at, at Tune now 15 years ago, uh, I kept studying uh, microtome tuberculosis sigma H transcription factor and that mutant in my own lab. And we showed um, that there was something very surprising about this mutant, that this mutant um, failed to express genes that were involved in thyroidoxin uh, pathways. So the thyroidoxin or thyroidoxin reductases were not induced in this mutant uh, that were induced in, the, in, in white type uh, in response to oxidative stress. So this was very interesting because thyroidoxins uh, actually uh, represent a, a tactic by the pathogen to scavenge oxidative first. Remember the, um, the life cycle slide that I showed you where there's an innate oxidative burst early on when the bacteria is picked up by angular mycophages. And you can imagine uh, by looking at this equation um, that if hydrogen peroxide or other oxidative radicals are produced during that oxidative burst, then these thyroid oxidants uh, can actually scavenge that by converting hydrogen peroxide to, to water and by getting oxidized themselves. This is a glycyl um, 5 mediated process. And then thyroid oxygen reductases can then further uh, take these oxidized thyroid oxygen back to uh, reduce form and, and, and therefore we can scavenge this oxidative burst. So that provided us with a hint uh, that this particular mutant was unable to scavenge oxidative burst, so that's why. Uh, it had a reduced pathology phenotype um, of the type that is shown in this cartoon. Uh, there are two different enzymes that, that produce oxidative burst. There is NADP and NADFOX, uh, which produces both the oxides uh, super ion as well as hydrogen peroxide. And there is INOS, of course, which everybody knows, produces the nitric oxide super ion. And both can damage uh, fatty acids on MTB surface. So you can imagine that in the absence of SIGH, this stress is not picked up. And then we went on to show that it's not just those three genes, SIGH actually orchestrates a much larger radio uh, So here I'm showing you at that time DNA microarray data comparison of white light microtome tuberculosis to the SIGH mutant. And if you provide with an oxidative stress and then go from left to right uh, in, in, uh, in time, this is time in minutes, you can see. Uh, that as you know, some genes are induced very quickly in MTB, not in CH, and then in 30 minutes this becomes uh, 100 genes, and then you can see downstream there are several pathways that are induced at different points of time, and then in about three hours the system reaches equilibrium. 
And this was because a CDH actually induces the expression of multiple other transcription factors, including multiple other sigma factors. And then they have their own regulons. And so it's not just these three genes. There's actually a large program there. And we then identified that lack of CDH, the mutant, actually not only is able to not scavenge stress, but it can actually also not deal with heat shock toxicity produced by various stress conditions, and has dysregulation of cysteine and sulfur metabolism, as shown by the lack of induction of many of these sulfur metabolism genes in the mutant as compared to the wild type strain. We have now shown, we and others have now shown that CDH actually responds to a variety of conditions, not just oxidative stress, but conditions which damage cell walls. So for example, those agents like tyrosine and vancomycin that damage cell walls and use that pathway, and acidic pH can, this was shown by Dave Russell's lab many years ago, and nitrosative stress and phagocytosis by Greg Schnappinger when he was a postdoc with Carl Nathan. And then Dave Russell, I'm sorry, Dave Sherman's lab, Dave Sherman's lab showed that enduring hypoxia and radiation also induces the CDH pathway. And very recently we showed, interestingly, that cigarette smoke extract also induces this very pathway. This was surprising to us. We had hypothesized that cigarette smoke might actually induce hypoxia later on, which also we studied, but we weren't surprised to find this. We actually are developing a model of cigarette smoke and TB co-infection in the cats. We have a hypothesis that cigarette smoke actually induces MTB virulence and promotes the formation of drug-resistant mutations. So it's not just oxidative stress, it's a much bigger phenomenon. And then the work of Jyoti Basu in India and also Vinayana Likuri, who is at your institution, has shed further light on this mechanism. And we now know that CDH is kept in a reduced environment by an anti-sigma factor, RSHA. And under oxidative stress, the protein-protein interaction between these two proteins is alleviated, and CDH is then free to bind its own promoter to auto-regulate and transcribe itself, and then all the downstream genes that I showed you earlier. And Vinay's very elegant work has further identified other transcription factors that keep CDH in check, and in the absence of these, cysteine metabolism expression is compromised, and therefore the bug is more susceptible to nitric oxide and superoxide killing in the fetal zone, which I also showed you earlier. So we then, about 10 years ago, put the CDH mutant in monkeys. By that time, we had established the active TB model that I showed you earlier in these monkeys, and we wanted to see what would happen with the CDH mutant. And we found that the CDH mutant fails to kill these monkeys. So in a model where all animals in the control group that are infected with a high dose of parental wild type tuberculosis were sent to euthanasia, none of the mutant-infected animals had any disease. And when we looked at bacterial numbers in the lungs of these animals, they were significantly lower as compared to controls, and we could see this by viral bacteria and also by the prevalence of bacteria in the lungs by stain. And then when we looked at pathology, the mutant-infected animals had no pathology. You can see that grossly in the middle panel. You can see that in histopathology on my right. And then in the panel on the left, you can see pathology numbers, morphometric evaluation of how much pathology is there. You can see that despite hitting these monkeys with 1,000 of the mutant CFUs, we had between 0 to 10 to 15 percent of lung pathology, but significantly lower than the control strain. So the difference here is, as compared to mice, we are able to show that the CDH mutant not only replicates, but also doesn't cause pathology. So I think I've shown you here that the expression of CDH is induced in a wide variety of stress conditions, such as heat shock, redox stress, low pH, phagocytosis, et cetera, et cetera. Expression of CDH causes a downstream induction of about 700 genes, actually, including many of the transcription factors 
including the clip procures proteolysis regulon and the thyroid auxin thyroid auxin reductase regulon and cysteine homeostasis pathways and and the lack of cigarette blunt signal pathology in murine lungs um and in the cat lungs it leads to a complete ablation of disease so clearly um the absence of cigarettes allows the host to respond to lung infection by tb in a manner that is inherently less destructive we found 154 less expression of mmp9 this is the one that i'm not showing you and and therefore the induction of cigarettes in vivo likely maintains an intrabacterial redox homeostasis allowing it to survive against the host phagocyte oxidative burst so um in ex vivo experiments we also showed that the cigarette mutant shown in red is compromised for its ability to grow in macrophages so this is work published many years ago uh, by a postdoc in my lab in uh, in primate in monkey macrophages so these were macrophages that were obtained from monkey uh, bone marrows and then expanded and very recently in collaboration with uh, chinna swami jagannath at uh, Bayer college of medicine about 200 miles from here uh, dheeraj singh who is a very able postdoc now staff scientist in my lab has actually shown that this is true in human um, macrophages as well. In human blood derived macrophages, uh, delta CH is compromised for its uh, ability to replicate as compared to wild type isotype strain. And uh, this actually has a very interesting phenotype. So the CH mutant has a hyperimmune phenotype in these human macrophages. So infection with CH as compared to wild type um, uh, isotype induces uh, the expression of autophagy genes as shown here. And the, uh, and the expression of type 1 interferon signaling genes as shown here and, and um, histone deacylases as well as certain genes, genes associated with protective responses to tuberculosis shown by many people including ourselves are induced when infection with CDA chapters as compared to infection with, with TB. And more importantly, uh, CDA actually induces a trained immunity phenotype. So trained immunity, which you can see here, by transcriptional responses to either CIGH and MTB isotype uh, inducing genes uh, known, known to be a trained immunity phenotype genes. And you can see here the hallmark uh, pathway for glycolysis is very clear. And this is very interesting because trained immunity has only been shown to occur with BCG and not with TB. And here they're showing by taking out the TB gene, you can actually induce a much stronger. Uh, training immunity phenotype with, with CIDH and human macrophages uh, than you would ever see with, with BCG. And you can see here uh, all classical hallmarks of training immunity are there in CIDH, TF, alpha signaling, uh, and uh, generalized inflammation type 1, um, and, and also P53 MEK uh, signal. Interestingly, we found uh, that the reason why CIDH may be Avirulent in macrophages is because it fails to inhibit phagorhizomal fusion. So here we study phagorhizomal fusion in a tunnel assay uh, by looking at co-localization of the pathogen with uh, with the LC3 signal. And as you can see here, um, while uh, there is just a slight increase in um, in, in phagorhizomal fusion with MTB infection of these humanized uh, of these human macrophages. There's a much significant uh, induction of uh, uh, phagocytoma fusion with the CIGH mutant. And we, DIRAC, has developed a very nice antigen presentation assay, ex vivo, using a CD4 hybridoma, where we measure antigen presentation uh, specific to 85B. This is in collaboration with Chin Yaganath. Uh, and then the readout is IL2 um, expression by, by CD4s. Uh, and you can see here, Macrophages that are infected with the mutant delta CH uh, actually uh, present antigen, TB antigen, at significantly higher level as compared to IC5 uh, wild type. And this process, as you would express, that, as you would expect, is Becklin 1 dependent, so in the silence, uh, Becklin 1, then this CH, the ability of CH to induce um, present antigen uh, goes away. So this part of the talk essentially tells us that the cigarette dependent regulon of MTV modulates interaction with the host innate system 
and one or two products of this regulon may interact actually with the host. for example, i did not show you data but the pro-inflammatory signal of following mtb infection is counterbalanced by cox two and and the increased production of cox two by mtb infected phagocytes may be responsible for this differential apoptosis and and autophagy effect that i showed you because the signature mutant is processed differently by host macrophages and cannot scavenge this the stressor that i showed you we hypothesized that this would be an ideal mutant strain for for serving as a vaccine because in macrophage models ex vivo it was producing the the type of immune responses that we would associate with vaccine induced protection so we decided to check this out in our model and we found that indeed the signature mutant protects significantly in our high dose active tb model as compared to bcg vaccinated in cats and unvaccinated in cats so the color code here is unvaccinated in cats in red bcg vaccinated in cats and and this light blue and and signature vaccinated in cats in this gujarat titans color bcg vaccinated in cats in delhi capitals color so as you can see here when you're looking at lung cfus there is there's three to four round reduction in in those animals that were vaccinated with cigh as compared to bcg and when we look at bronchial lymph node this infection this this differential reduction of cfu stays and when we look at the pathology of these lungs there are very few granulomas in cigh vaccinated animals particularly you look at the top panel which is sub gross pathology and there you can see low level reduction of granuloma formation in the cigh vaccinated animals and the granulomas that are there are much smaller and this reduction and this 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 protection from vaccination with cigh was characterized by a robust innate and adaptive responses so this is post vaccination a few weeks after vaccination we were able to take bronchial alveolar lavages longitudinally from these the cats and studying them by transcriptomics and you can see that innate pathways are induced as well as t-cell signaling to significantly higher levels in cigh in cats as compared to bcg vaccinated in cats and when we study by our traditional route hyperemetic flow cytometry which is what my lab really knows how to do you can see a significantly greater recruitment of both cd4s and cdh cells to the lungs of these you know dark blue these are titans color as compared to this light blue color and these t-cells both cd4s at the top and cdh at the bottom that are recruited to high levels actually express high levels of cd69 which is a t-cell activation marker very interestingly we found that the animals that have been vaccinated with cigh at the bottom over here had a significantly high level of recruitment of b-cells to the granuloma as well and these are not just your ordinary b-cells they're organized in these tight follicles around the granuloma in fact we used to call them inducible bronchus associated lymphoid tissue we now call them granuloma associated lymphoid tissue and and these the characteristics here are that there are b-cells in red this is cd20 antibody so they're b-cells and they are intermixed with t follicular helper cells that express cdxcr5 and this is a very tight collaboration that i had with shavana khader this collaboration developed when shavana was at the university of pittsburgh and i was at tulane climate center and we've now both moved places but the collaboration has only become stronger and in fact the the eyeballs response in your cdh vaccinated monkeys was so strong near the granuloma so so first of all there were very few granulomas in this group but whenever granulomas were formed they were characterized by this eyeball to rf response that you actually did not need cd20 staining to see this you can see this clearly just by etching the the lymphoid influx that you see in these granulomas as compared to your what we consider our ineffective granulomas formed by bcg vaccination followed by challenge or no vaccination followed by challenge and again with the same color code you can see 
you know, this is just measurements, greater eyeballed presence, but much lower granuloma area. So the product of these two numbers is a highly significant powerful granuloma formation in CDH2X patient animals. And then Dr. Mehera's lab, who works with me, ended up showing, this is her project, but she ended up showing that this vaccine, CDH, is actually safe in the setting of HIV co-infection. So when we co-infect our monkeys that are infected with MTB and have latent disease with SIV, then these monkeys reactivate disease, so their disease levels go up, systemic inflammation levels go up, and bacterial burdens go up. But when we took these vaccine-infected monkeys and co-infected them with SIV, that did not happen, and the pathology stayed low in these animals, and these differences were not because these animals did not get the virus. You can see here the colored animals, which are co-infected with SIV after vaccination, have the same amount of virus as the MTB-SIV co-infected animals. And these animals also did not reactivate, not because they did not lose CD4 cells, so one critical aspect of HIV co-infection is immunodeficiency and loss of CD4 cells, and SIV recapitulates that. So you can see here, CD4 cells right here are in use in MTB-infected animals, and at week 7, at week 9, we co-infect them with our virus, SIV. Week 34 weeks after the virus co-infection, these CD4 cells disappear from the lung because this is immunodeficiency. And yet, the vaccine does not actually reactivate. So CD4 cells don't persist, the vaccine doesn't reactivate, but what persists is these eyeballs that I showed you earlier. So we think that protection by CIGH is related to eyeball. Around that time, Shabana and I started collaborating with Tom Scriba at Cape Town, and Tom had shown in this beautiful, much-talked-about Lancet paper that IF4, interferon GDP-dependent transcription factor 4, expression is actually correlated and downgraded, is correlated with protection from disease. So this mRNA expression, as shown here, is downregulated in CD4 T cells during active TB disease as compared to people that are healthy or people that have only LTBI. And in the middle panel, as you see over here, when we ex vivo stimulate PBMCs, and by we, I mean Tom Scriba's group, when he ex vivo stimulated PBMCs from MTB-infected humans who had stayed non-progressive in blue as compared to the ones that had progressed to TB, there was significantly lower IF4 expression in the progressors. And then in my own lab, we ended up showing, inspired from Tom's work, that IF4 expression was significantly higher in non-progressive monkeys, the monkeys that had LTBI as compared to progressive monkeys. So all of these results indicated to our group that IF expression is downregulated in active TB. And Shabana's group became very interested in studying the role of IF4, and we coincided at IVOD, and I'll show you this in a couple of slides. So Shabana made flocks, mice, in IF4 deficient mice and C4 cells and C19 cells or B cells, and she ended up showing that only those mice that lacked IF4 expression on C4 cells were unable to contain TB, while those that lacked IF4 generally or those that had IF4 in B cells did not have more infection and more inflammation and more lack of IVOD, as measured here by T follicular helper cells that are C4 positive, C4 double positive, CXCF5 triple positive. So clearly, IF expression in just C4 T cells is required for control of TB, possibly by generating T follicular helper cells in mice. And I'm now going to show you a bunch of data that's part of this paper that is almost accepted in nature immunology. This is a collaboration 
something that's borderline. But she ended up showing that IL-4 expressing T cells are T follicular helper phenotype, and that these cells induce high levels of PD-1 and CFCR5. I showed you that data partly. And that these cells are responsible for actually bringing B cells to IL-4 or the blood in a process that is regulated by BCL-6. And there's too much data to show in this talk, and I'm not showing you this data. And then finally, we ended up showing that these B cells that are present in the abolicus-associated lymphoid tissue, which is induced during CDH vaccination, are MTB-specific, and they're important in mediating CD4 T cell activation and agitation locally. So Shavana took advantage of a mouse trail where B cells are only made to lysozyme agitate, IBM MD4 mouse. And in this mouse, even when they're infected with TB, B cells are not made in response to TB agitants, and that mouse is more susceptible, has fewer follicular helper cells, and that these follicular helper cells represent incorrect phenotype in the sense they're not CD44 positive, or that they do not produce cytokines, including interferon gamma, to the same levels as MTB-infected mice. So clearly showing the interplay between CD4 T follicular helper cells and B cells as being important in the organization of IBOLD and T cell activation. So we actually ended up showing this in the monkey model as well, and I apologize for going back and forth between the mouse and the monkey model, but I think it was important. So I showed you earlier that if you vaccinate with CDH, then the monkeys are protected. Even if you expose these monkeys to MTB, there's no disease, but if you don't have the vaccination up front with CDH, you expose these monkeys to MTB, and then there's a lot of disease. So we started depleting CD20 or B cells by giving a seminized antibody, which is a seminized metacarnist version of rituximab. So rituximab is an antibody that would deplete all CD20 cells, and we just seminized it so it wouldn't cause serum sickness in our monkeys, and we optimized this antibody, and we showed that this antibody is very adept at depleting B cells from the periphery as well as the lung, but it needed to be given every three weeks. And so we came up with this experimental design that just before MTB infection, we would deplete B cells from either the vaccinated monkeys shown in purple color or control monkeys that were not vaccinated and in gray color, and then we would challenge both those groups. And as you can see here, there is a significant reduction of B cells, and you can see the same result by confocal microscopy. Interestingly, what we found was that when we depleted these eyeballed B cells from the lungs of these monkeys, disease came back. So the protective efficacy of CDH went away. This you can see here using an inflammatory marker as a readout of TB, but the proof is in the pudding. You can see this by bacterial numbers in the lung, and actually bacterial numbers in individual granulomas were significantly higher when B cells were depleted in monkeys as compared to when they weren't. And very interestingly, the CD4 cells from the lungs of these monkeys were not properly activated, so they were not CHCF5 positive, meaning they were not T follicular helper cells, and they were not activated, they were not B1 positive. So in the absence of B cells, T cells in the lungs of these monkeys are not properly activated. So I think in this part of the data, I've shown you that CDH protects against lethal tuberculosis in the susceptible macaque model by using robust local innate and adaptive responses, and in particular, by causing the formation of eyeballs. And that this mutant is safe, and that eyeballs responses are not just a characteristic of CDH, but are actually very important for protection, and that we've finalized the mechanisms of this protection. And so we believed at that point of time, a few years ago, that human testing of CDH mutant or its derivative, both in the absence and the presence of HIV co-infection, is a viable 
strategy. But when we went to the NIH and to the Gates Foundation, they suggested that we do a few more experiments, including aerosol vaccination with this mutant genus that can species of non-human primates independently. So at that point of time, I was fortunate that Gila joined my lab. He's a brilliant immunologist. He joined my lab from ICTV and JNU. And he set up this experiment, which is, which we have had going on at two different locations in my lab. At Tulane earlier, where he joined me and then moved here, and at Sukhobrin, where we were kidnapped to do COVID monkey work. And now we are back to doing TB science. And Gila just completed this very interesting experiment, where we took Cynomonas macaques, which are a more resistant macaque species, and again did this experiment in a large number of monkeys that were either vaccinated, vaccinated with the standard vaccine, or with our mutant. And then we studied what happened in those monkeys. And this work is almost ready for publication. In this particular work, we focused more on developing single cell based RNA-seq correlates of protection. But just to give you a sliver of the data, the protection phenotype at CIDH is actually maintained in the second macaque species as well, as you can see here. And this is because of induction of very early levels of antigen-specific T-cell responses in the lung of CIDH vaccinated as compared to BCG vaccinated animals. As I showed you earlier in these macaques, and in signals we were able to show this, this one week after vaccination. And very interestingly, DRAG was able to show that it's not just generalized T-cell responses, but antigen-specific CD8 responses. So here you're seeing the recruitment of CD8 responses that respond to NPD cell wall and produce interferon, gamma, TNF-alpha, and the enzyme via triple positive to much higher levels in the lungs of those animals that are BCG vaccinated as compared to CIDH vaccinated. The timing of this curve is correct because earlier on, DRAG sees an increased induction of CD4 cells. So we believe this is the mechanism by which these macaques are protected. And this mechanism is not surprising because a mutant is getting processed in a way that antigen presentation is better. And we can show this same result with specific antigens, with the pegs specific for ESAC-6 and CFP10, as well as for the whole antigen base in NTP. So just to summarize, what I think happens is that when pathogenic NTP pathogenize or parasitize macrophages, then many pathways collaborate, including CIDH, which induces antioxidants to protect the bacteria from oxidative versus this leads to the survival of the bug in this large granuloma. In this granuloma, bad things happen, characterized by the induction of indolibine dioxygenase, IL-10, PD-L1, which downregulates PD-1, TGF, and beta fibrosis, and therefore a necrosis in the center, hypoxia in the center. And therefore, this leads to a bad outcome for the host, a good outcome for the pathogen, that is, it's persistent. But when macrophages encounter CIDH, then three things happen. There is no CIDH in the mutant, and therefore no antioxidants. And this leads to control of granuloma size and its necrosis, necrotic center. And there is no blockage of phagolysomal fusion, which is also data I showed you in extremo macrophages. And this leads to better antigen presentation on these macrophages that are infected, therefore leading to better antigen-specific responses. And then finally, there is no induction, there is greater induction of IL-4, which leads to this eyeball formation, which Shavana has elegantly shown in this mouse model that I showed you a sliver of data from. So these three things combined together leads to a much more robust CD4, CD8, T-cell response, and antibody-producing T-cell responses upon vaccination with CIDH. And that's what is probably responsible for this protection that we see. 
So to summarize everything, I think I've shown you clearly today that vaccination with ciliates protects two different species of macaques that produce human-like granulomas by the immune responses that I showed you, and that this vaccine is safe. So we're doing several things now in our lab to further this. We are combining ciliates with multiple other single or double mutations to generate double or triple mutations in MPV. This is necessary to meet the legal convention before human testing can begin. And ideally, our double and triple mutants would regain immunogenicity, but be equally safe, if not safer, and we would test this in the NHP model. DHS has already begun this testing. And we would like to identify specific, further identify specific mechanisms of protection from ciliates by doing a bunch of depletions. We are funded to do these three things, and then we are seeking funding from both the NIH and the foundation to study how a vaccine can actually protect against heterologous challenge, and this protection is durable over months and years, and if this durability is maintained in the face of HIV co-infection. So I showed you that the vaccine is safe with HIV co-infection, but what if the people are already HIV infected? Would this vaccine work in those individuals? And there's some doubt because of the mechanisms that I showed you. And then finally, we're interested in seeing, because of the phenotype, the hyperimmune phenotype and training energy phenotype that I showed you, whether ciliates can be used as a therapeutic vaccine for TB. So I'd like to end here. Thank a bunch of people, primarily Dheeraj, who did some of the new work that I presented today, and Alison and Taylor, ex-graduate students of my lab. A huge thanks to Shivana and Jagannath and Tom, whose data I presented, and funding bodies that funded this work. And I'm very happy to take questions, and to young members of the audience, please feel free to join us if you think this work is exciting. I'm sure our audience enjoyed hearing you. Now the session is open for the questions. I request please come near the podium to ask the questions. Good morning, sir. Your talk was so fascinating that I'm prompted to ask a few questions. So my first question is, as you have said that ciliates mutant, there was like reduction in thyroid options level. So I wanted to know, like, does this also impact the other redox buffers which are known in case of MTV, like mycothiol, ergothioline? Yes, it actually impacted the beta reduction gene, but mycothiols were not impacted by ciliates. And I think it's been shown that the transcriptional regulation of mycothiol occurs differently. So if I was to guess, just based on transcriptional numbers, I would think that thyroid option and mycothiols probably constitute 50% of the buffer, because several other important thyroid buffers are lacking in TB. So it's a 50-50 thing. And so when you don't have thyroid options, you have about a 50% reduction in thyroid capacity in the bug. And as you see with the macrophage data, that's sufficient to cause a significant reduction in survival. Sir, my next question is, is there any difference in secretory profiles of MTB wild type and ciliates mutant? As you have shown that there is a blocking of phagolysosomal fusion, and a lot of key MTB proteins are involved in it. Yeah, so we do have some unpublished data that is part of the same trust of data that I showed you earlier, but it was not possible to show everything. But we do think that the mutant actually ends up in the cytosol much more efficiently than TB. And this is, again, not surprising, because we and others have shown this for another mutant, CD, which is downstream of ciliates. So the phenotype of the CD mutant actually phenocopies ciliates to a large extent. And even then, even there, Ricardo Mignanelli has shown that that mutant also ends up in the cytosol. And that's probably the reason 
for this increased MHC class 1 antigen presentation that we are seeing in vaccination monkeys. Thank you, sir. Hello. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful talk. I have a question that can we add the CKH targeting drugs to a current therapy as they will also act as immunomodulators? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I think uh, others have tried this approach or are trying this approach. Um, uh, my lab doesn't have experience with this. I will not tell people, um, it will just uh, you know, host pathogen people. But I think this is a great idea. Um, you know, the, this flavor of data that I showed you uh, that um, CKH is induced in, um, in um, people that uh, in, in macrophages that were exposed to smoke um, actually is validated in human uh, samples as well. And so your question, your attempt to modulate CKH activity uh, is a very good one. Uh, the specificity of that modulation would probably be challenging. So one more question from your in initial side, uh, slides that uh, uh, in which you shows that uh, uh, after infecting a uh, macaca, uh, one uh, double active disease and another double latent uh, TB. So do we have explanation for that? That uh, what is the mechanism that one uh, host is developing latent TB uh, or other one is succumb to the active TB? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> In monkey, so I started working on monkeys about 15 years ago, and Joanne uh, has worked on monkeys for maybe a few years before me. Together in Joanne's lab, in my lab, uh, and now a few other people working with monkeys with TB, we just don't have enough monkeys to actually do a, um, a powerful genetic analysis. But it's possible that there is a genetic effect there. Uh, people have been infecting monkeys with the semen immunodeficiency virus for much longer. Uh, the primary centers of the type that I work in sort of exist uh, because they were uh, used to make models, uh, generate models of AIDS. And so there's been you know, hundreds of thousands of monkeys that have been infected in different studies there. And there they have worked out a uh, genetic basis for, um, for, for HIV infection in monkeys that actually exclude certain nanotypes, certain HLA types from their studies because they are either super controllers or are super susceptible to HIV. And I feel like the same could be true for TB, uh, but we just don't have, uh, there's, there's several hundred monkeys that Joanna and I have infected together, just are not, would not provide a powerful genetic uh, a tool to study that. Uh, there are other possibilities as well, and, and it's possible that um, multiple things are at play here. Uh, so we, uh, and others, including uh, primarily Joanne, have shown that every granuloma in our monkeys is actually an individual entity. So, in a monkey, um, sometimes 10 granulomas may form, and all 10 may be controller type granulomas. So, you have very low CFUs, and, and therefore that monkey gets characterized as controller or an ATBI. Uh, the antigen gun or the bacilli don't leak into the into the uh, circulation and, and therefore disease is controlled. But if one granuloma becomes active, uh, then the entire monkey can, can become active. And, and that happens. We see that from time to time. We see a large amount of variation in individual granuloma performance. And uh, that could be related to where the granuloma forms and whether uh, the site where the granuloma forms is more oxygenated versus less. Um, and whether it is better or poorly vascularized, and therefore antigen specific T cells can, can, can reach that site more effectively or not. Uh, those, those factors are play, so it's very esoteric and, and variable environment. And, and we don't understand this as, as well as we would like to. Okay, thank you so much. Great work. So uh, I just have a curiosity that uh, if you uh, in the CGH immunized, uh, mutant CGH immunized monkeys or mice, if you give the ox drugs that uh, disturb the redox potential along with the vaccine, will the effect will be uh, additive and you might get a complete protection and the second is or instead of the drugs that 
disturb the redox, you can do proteasome inhibitors. And what are the results? Yeah, so this is a very good question. We've talked about it. We haven't done these experiments um, uh, because monkeys are expensive to work with and we have to, to choose our, our experiments. Uh, but this is something uh, that we would love to do. Uh, at this point of time, we almost exclusively work, work with monkeys. And in mice, in, in these six mice, uh, as I showed you earlier, this clearing phenotype is not seen. We only see the reduction of pathology. So that uh, may not be the best model uh, to study this. Uh, but otherwise, your suggestion of um, adjunctively using drugs that, that perturb uh, redox potential um, is a very good one. And one that we should someday try in, uh, in, uh, in monkeys. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for a very interesting talk. So I'm just uh, curious to know, uh, uh, like, what are these granuloma-associated uh, T cell? Are they different from NAT or MAT? If yes, so what are the nature of these cells in HIV TB co-infection? You're talking about granuloma-associated B cells or T cells? Uh, T cell, grant. Yeah. So BOLT or grant is actually um, a multicellular uh, complex. It's, it's primarily B cells. They are CD19 positive, CD20 positive, CD79 positive. So they are activated B cells. They're not, uh, they're not antibody producing plasma cells, but they are B cells. They're antigen specific and, 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 and activated. And they encapsulate T cells uh, that are T follicular helpers. So they are CD40, uh, they're CD4, of course, but they are CD40 more high. PD1 high and CXCR, CXCR, CXCR5 high. So they are uh, your uh, follicular helper cells. And they, uh, together, the B cells and the TFHs make these follicular structures. And, and we believe that there is a local level education of T cells happening in the lungs with, with the presence of these B cells. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Hello, sir. Sir, thank you for the insightful talk. Sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, uh, in the slide where you talked about the, uh, the stress conditions, so did you check the stress conditions against the other sigma factors which you mentioned? Yeah, this is, this is old work when I was young. Um, yes, so sig H, C, E, and sig D are induced by thyroid oxidative stress. Um, and that's because CH is induced and E and B are downstream of it. Uh, the other uh, 10 sigma factors are not induced by that stress, but CF is, for example, known to be induced by stationary phase, and, and uh, other sigma factors are known to be induced by other conditions uh, that I don't study and uh, not remember now, but, but they all have specific conditions under which they are induced, and, and many of those in vitro conditions mimic what happens in vivo. So my next question is, so, uh, do other uh, transcription factors play a role in protection against MTB? Yeah, this is a very complex phenomenon. So for example, um, you know, within the first two hours after a strong induction of SIGET, uh, I showed you 700 genes are induced and, and about 20 of them are transcription factors each of them having their own uh, specific uh, regulons and their own specific effects. Okay, um, so. so clearly all of those are involved and, and I think David Russell has published a very elegant paper uh, five, six, seven years ago in Nature Communications where he has actually performed chromatin-based identification of, of regulons of, of different transcription factors and shown interoperability between uh, SIG X, SIG E, SIG B and, and various other transcription factors that my screen initially identified. So clearly, um, there is uh, interplay between these signaling pathways and there is uh, redundancy that MTB has built in uh, because this is clearly an important pathway for survival in the Okay. So my next question is, in macaques, we observed the SIG H as a significant transcription factor. Uh, which could be the possible transcription factor in the case of humans, which we can study? Yeah, so I, I think that the question is, if we take um, 
empty the out of uh, of the CAC lungs. A SIGA GPUs, the answer is absolutely yes. I did not show you the data. It's published about five years ago by a clinic a clinician post up in my lab. Um, uh, so Theresa Hudock. Uh, so the paper was published in the Red Journal uh, with her as the first author. So she uh, micro dissected granulomas from active and latent again, and absolutely SIGA is induced. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I'm quite sure if we could leverage active people that have recently converted and become recently become active by X-ray or PET scan human beings, then we would be able to show induction of SIGA in, in, uh, in those lung samples as well. There's no doubt in my mind. So one last question. So what is the basic difference between Delta SIGA and SIGA? So Delta SIGA is, is a, a isogenic mutant strain. Uh, so it's a strain where uh, the gene is being replaced by you know, some junk DNA. Uh, so it's, it's an isogenic mutant. And uh, a SIGA we are referring to the gene. So when I talk about Delta SIGA, that's, that's just an isogenic one gene mutation in MGD. Uh, so that SIGA is not present. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for a very interesting and enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure everyone have uh, enjoyed it. So, uh, and you know, being a TB researcher, I totally understand the importance of these NSP models uh, to unravel the complexity of human tuberculosis. Thank you once again for agreeing to be as one of our plenary speakers. Uh, it was really a privilege hearing you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. So in this session, our next speaker is Professor Govardhan Das, Chairperson of Special Center for Molecular Medicine, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. It's really a privilege, sir, to have you among us. Dr. Das is an eminent scientist in the field of mycobacterium tuberculosis research. He has done many breakthrough research in the area and published a number of research articles in various popular international journals. He has established that MTB gains dormancy in mesenchymal stem cells which serve as long-term natural reservoir of dormant bacteria. Today he is going to talk about mycobacterium tuberculosis programs mesenchymal stem cells to establish dormancy and persistence. Now I welcome Dr. Das to deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. Okay, uh, I'm audible? Yeah. So, uh, Thanks organizers for uh, inviting me here today, although I really don't want to, I, I really don't want to talk about this is uh, coming back, but uh, still I feel ICGB is my home. In every paper when I write this is uh, thanks to ICGB, I, uh, uh, you know, I, my feeling is why to thank my own home, because uh, still I feel ICGB is my home. So that is what, um, you know, uh, coming back to you in the once again this auditorium is a kind of a uh, emotional thing and, uh, and you know you know in ICGB animal house ICGB BSL3 all these facilities this is kind of um, is you know uh, developed in front of uh, me I was one of the uh, person uh, who uh, kind of involved in fact in this auditorium now is sitting three generations of um, scientific fraternity in the TB immunology and uh, I see his uh, uh, Dr. Pavan Sharma I was this I was his student he actually uh, taught me you know in, in hand actually just how to do um, immunology and how to uh, you know solve the problem how to in fact ask the problem and then uh, I I'm happy that I could actually transmit those some of the things to my students here sitting is Beth one of the successful students and the um, uh, 
uh, uh, Deepak, my good friend, he also talked about Dhiraj. So some of my students are kind of now doing good. So that's that's feel good. So now I feel I, I, I it is time for me to retire. And <laughs> anyway, so and uh, last uh, uh, two three years. Um, uh, because of lockdown and the um, uh, availability of facilities, we really couldn't do much of uh, uh, you know, progress in science. However, um, I'll talk about some of the things what we were doing and together with the Ved and other um, uh, students. If some of you might have heard of those uh, things in other of the places, so it is, uh, you know, um, so those who are, have heard me in last uh, couple of years so basically they may have get get something out of it. Well some of the things what we are doing in our in our lab, one of the main things, one of the major things we are doing, how latent TB actually contributes, how the latent TB uh, happens. If you look at the, the, the tuberculosis is a, of course is a problem. But one third of the global population they actually are having the, the uh, latent TB or the dormant TB. And that is a big reservoir in any catastrophe where the immune, uh, you know, uh, there is a, if there is a problem with the immune system, if there is a uh, uh, hindrance with the immune system, that may come back. And so, therefore, you can get, get back and get the uh, uh, active TB. So, if you look at the TB, TB is a really old disease, uh, basically known the, in human in history. This is the oldest uh, um, the infectious disease known. How old is this? If you look at this, is the 500,000 BC, if one can really trace out TB. Then, if you, this is the, in this mummy, 10,000 years old mummy, this is also, this is the person died because of TB. Now, today, and uh, TB, that means if, uh, if you look at today, almost two, 2 million people die every year, one part of the global population is infected with latent TB and almost all the countries irrespective of uh, socioeconomic status are under threat from the drug resistant TB. Why I am saying is this slide is that tuberculosis actually co-evolved with the human evolution starting from the co-erectus to to homo sapiens. That means that this bug is somehow successful to co-evolve with the human evolution. So, in when we talk about the uh, TB, TB in India is a big problem, and 300 million people infected. Although this data is little old, and which contributes the 21 percent of the global incidences, and more than 300,000 people uh, Indians die uh, because of TB, and that means that within these two minutes, already some uh, somebody died because of TB. And also the incidence of tuberculosis, EA, MDR, multiple drug resistant uh, TB in, is the probably highest in the world. So all I am trying to say this is India is a big problem, India has a big problem with, with the tuberculosis, we have to handle it, handle with it. Now what is the problem with the TB, how they coexists with the, throughout the whole uh, 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 human evolution. If you look at the very carefully, it is the bug which can persist for a long time and in the latent form. So this is, uh, although the, if you look at the host protective immune response, which we know this is TH1 kind of immune response is required for the elimination of TB, but, but still, if you look at the patients, those who are coming in the clinic, if you do the Monto test, all positive, that means they are mounting uh, uh, host protective immune response. Still, the body is surviving. The current therapy, already we have the current therapy, but we call it DOCS. So, directly observed um, uh, treatment short course, which is the multiple uh, drugs, which is uh, uh, isoenzyme, rifampicin, ethambutal, and the parazinamide. This is the six month for the regular TB. However, if for a drug resistant TB, even the, it's much longer depending on the what kind of drug resistance are. So basically, what I'm trying to say, although it's a short course, it's a minimum uh, treatment is six months, which is in opposed to other other um, uh, uh, other infections five uh, five days to ten days at the max. So this is an unusually uh, long treatment. And another important thing is this 
these uh, antibiotics that have the severe side effects in fact some of the components like rifampicin that during the treatment period the one can see this is see uh, very uh, blur vision and also the hugely hepatotoxic when because of the toxicity most many of the times the, the patients withdraw from the, uh, from the uh, uh, therapy and another thing recently we also um, uh, you know, uh, reported and it is also known patients those who are treated with these antibiotics they actually become vulnerable for the reinfection although they are treated they are cured and the, when they come back once again they get the disease that's because probably some of the things what is happening during the treatment not only you are killing the bugs but also you are somehow weakening your uh, immune responses so our simple question so how is the problem and how, uh, how and what we could do is if you look at we started uh, looking at the what the kinetics of bug uh, tuberculosis uh, your, uh, disappearance during the treatment if you look at carefully the majority of the bugs during the treatment is a uh, within less than one month more than 99 percent your uh, bugs tb disappear but the less than one percent bug the for treatment it takes a huge long time this is a the four months to six months so that um, for the regular tb that means this biphasic curve is because because of probably there are two kinds of bugs what we are unaware of so that means the current regimen of treatment may not answer or may not equally treat two types of bugs so therefore if i can quote anthony fauci who is uh, the director of nih we said that we need to better understand the delicate balance between the host and pathogen in the context of entire biological system and this is requires a radical and transformational uh, approach so for that means basically we most of the time what to do the tv research in the very isolation but we have to do understand in a whole biological system that's an in vivo system with the right appropriate model so so then what we are thinking uh, is a the therapeutics then we see this is multiple antibiotics and they have the toxicity and lindy which actually is a perfect combination for generation of uh, drug resistance so therefore what we thought so that means if any uh, therapeutic agent which physically interacts with the target today or tomorrow the bug will come up with the, the mechanism to avoid these drugs so therefore, what we thought, can we do some kind of immunotherapeutic approach? If we do immunotherapeutic approach, that's because although we talk about one third of the global population infected, but two thirds of us, we are doing absolutely fine. That means our immune system is sufficient to keep the bugs at bay. So therefore, can we modulate our immune system to a place where the bug can be eliminated? And if you do so, so you are generating immune response and that immune response may lead to the generation of memory and that may lead to the as a self proper vaccine that was the idea so now if everybody wants to do in the uh, uh, you know immunology in human but you 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 cannot really do uh, you know carpentry in, in in humans so therefore you have to do some kind of model easy model is of course mouse here is available and we can do some kind of uh, you know uh, you know knockout and uh, all these experiments but which is not possible in, in human so then we can further extrapolate in, uh, in, in human in latter stage so we started working on the simple with the simple question what is the T cell response during the uh, uh, MTB infection in mouse so what we have done is we have done uh, we infected the animals with of course uh, low dose of uh, uh, aerosol infection which uh, and then we started you know, activating the cells with the concavalent A to the in the spleen cells because the spleen cells because this is a secondary lymphoid organ where the 
the huge number of T cells and B cells are there. So basically, if you activate with the percovalin A, this is a uh, uh, mitogen for the T cells. So you will get the immune response in the proliferation. So which you measure the proliferation with the thiamine incorporation. As you see, the spleen cell, if the spleen cells are coming from the wild type animal, uninfected animal, the see, you see this is uh, it uh, uh, huge proliferation in a dose dependent manner. But in the same spleen cells from the infected animals, they, they respond very poorly. So now, what is the problem? Is it the problem with the, uh, with the T cells or is it problem with the, the uh, some other cells? Because the T cell proliferation depends not only on the by T cell itself, but also the associate cells, which we, we call it antigen presenting cells. So we isolated CD4 and CD8 T cells and then activated on the plate bound anti CD3 anti CD28 antibodies. As you see, if the cells of you know, CD4 and CD8 T cells are isolated, they actually responded equal, almost equally. That means there is a problem with, with not on, on with the T cells, but is a problem from somewhere else. That means that is coming from the APC compartment. The, now the question is, where is the problem? Is the APC com in the APC compartment? To ensure that it is coming from the APC compartment, we did the, a crisscross experiment. What we mean by crisscross experiment? You isolated CD4 T cells from the infected mice or the wild type mice, and then mixed with the APCs from either of these uh, uh, of these animals. When you do the one thing I can tell you, the wherever we used the APC from the infected animals, there is proliferation of the T cells gone down, suggesting that there is something in this is in this compartment. After it took almost a six to eight months for us to find out what's going on in there. What who is actually contributing this inhibition, the T cell proliferation? So. What one fine morning, what we have seen, there is a huge number, we started staining, which number of infiltrated as SCAR1 positive cells. What is SCAR1? As you know, the, from the name itself, because stem cell antigen. So it's basically, this probably these are the uh, stem cells. Then we characterized with in details and indeed we found it is uh, the uh, stem cells, but they are not the conventional uh, stem cells, they are the mesenchymal stem cells and whether they are the really bona fide mesenchymal stem cells. We did the differentiation, we isolated these cells and did a differentiation experiment. Indeed, we can differentiate to the different cell types. Here we are showing you that they can be, you know, uh, differentiated to adipocytes. Now, already it is known that uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells can do immunosuppression. So, if it is mesenchymal stem cells, it is doing immunosuppression. Is the immunosuppression in general or this is the site specific? If it is the Im uh, immunosuppression, the TB infected animals or for that matter, if that can be trans uh, 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 extrapolated to human, the TB infected uh, uh, you know, human can die with other infection. So that may not be uh, true. So to test that, what we did is, we did uh, the uh, uh, another experiment, what we did is we uh, immunized uh, these animals, infected or uninfected animals, with the bystander antigen, which is called ovalbumin, and look at the uh, take, take out the uh, draining lymph node after uh, 10 days and looked at an in vitro challenge and look at the proliferation. As, as you see from here, if the, um, the uh, both the infected and uninfected animals they did perfectly uh, uh, well almost the similar uh, uh, proliferation of the T cells, suggesting that it is on the local phenomena where the TBs, TB bugs are uh, residing. So, for that this is a uh, unrelated antigen ovalbumin. This is a complete soluble antigen which is all the, uh, derived from the, uh, derived from the, uh, the MTB. As you see in the draining lymph node, we can see there is a huge uh, uh, antigen specific uh, 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 and a proliferation of of the T cells. <coughs> then we wanted to look at the, what happens in the, the in the draining lymph node. As you see in the draining lymph node, we don't see any SCA1 positive cells. If there is no stem cell present in there. So then we wanted to look at where, where is this uh, um, uh, bulbs and how where is the location of these uh, stem cells. This is the as you see this is the uh, in the uh, 
lung granuloma, but uh, as you uh, mentioned, Deepak also mentioned, in, in mouse, the granuloma is not well structured, but definitely we can see granuloma-like granul granuloma structure, and within this granuloma, we can see some bacilli. Suggesting that, that actually, the, 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 all this immunosuppression in and around with this granuloma and within the uh, within uh, the uh, the uh, spleen cells. So now, how this basic chemical stem cells are causing the inhibition of T cell proliferation? One of the way to inhibit the T cell proliferation by basic chemical stem cells is known by uh, nitric oxide. So therefore, we wanted to look at the, what is the um, nitric oxide content. As you see, if the spleen cells are coming from the infected animal, there is a uh, huge amount of nitric oxide production. And then, what we wanted to do, if we inhibit this nitric oxide, there is you no know, nitric oxide production, it can be inhibited by the inhibition of the enzyme, uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase, which is, it can be inhibited by LNMA. If we do the same experiment in, in absence of LNMA, we can get back some of the proliferative uh, activities and if we also physically remove the mesenchymal stem cell from the uh, spleen cells uh, we can get back this uh, proliferative activity once again and if we remove this uh, mesenchymal stem cells from these spleen cells you see this is um, uh, production of nitric oxide gone down with compared to uh, these two um, graphs once again suggesting that uh, Well, uh, MSC actually uh, it uh, immunosuppress uh, many of many of the cases. In very actually nowadays people talk about the various types of uh, 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 mesenchymal stem cells. Some of the mesenchymal stem cells can actually mount immune response, elevate immune response. Some of the mesenchymal stem cells, in, in fact, inhibit immune responses. And these mesenchymal stem cells are immigrated from somewhere, some other tissues of the bone marrow to the site of infection they have the capacity for uh, inhibit the uh, T cell responses. Oh, well, BARG actually, what the BARG did attract the cells at the site of the infection. Okay. Okay. So, uh, is that answer your question? Okay. So, now, if I look at, um, so far we did this is, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, they are producing nitric oxide and uh, that could suppress the, your uh, T cell uh, proliferation. How do you prove that actually leads to the, the susceptibility or resistance to, a, to, a, to, 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 a, to an animal? To do that, we did some kind of experiment and what the experiment is, we had to find uh, an animal strain which are resistant to MTB. So this is it. In another uh, you know, um, uh, project, we did uh, extensive work on the various mouse models and the where we have found the one animal model, TGF beta receptor dominant negative animal. So that means these animals really do not respond to TGF beta. They are the mostly resistant to MTB infection. So what we did is we infected these animals and then after 30 days, we took out the mesenchymal stem cells, we shot in mesenchymal stem cells and then then infused and then we infected with the, uh, uh, with the MTB. And as you see, if uh, there is no cells because of this animals is uh, almost resistant, as you see, you do not see any, uh, you know, very few uh, MTB bugs and then if you infuse the mesenchymal stem cells in these animals and then in fact, as you see, some kind of uh, CFE you can get it, although it's not as much as wild type animal. In wild type animal, you see the million bugs after one month, but we don't uh, attain that much of. However, we can get uh, at least uh, 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 of the, the uh, CFUs. And if you take it to our control, the adherent cell, with the, if you take adherent cell without the mesenchymal stem cells, that once again we do not get much of this uh, infection. 
From here, he is suggesting that basic chemistry of cells is somehow making this animal susceptible to MTB in, in infection. Yeah. That's correct. So it, it is very, very difficult to get that many nascent chemistry cells in a one place. That because in, the, in bone marrow, it's a uh, incidence of nascent chemistry is 0.005%, I believe. 0.05%. So therefore, it is to enrich the number. And in addition, so basically because of infection, there might be some local milieu that makes this uh, machine chemistry even more suppressive. That is what we uh, have isolated machine chemistry from the infected animals. So now what this machine chemistry cells are doing? So that uh, because of a chemokine ingredient, so we haven't done any experiment on that. However, there's a very interesting question. We can definitely can do that. Uh, uh, yes. Right. So this is very good question. Actually, in any inflammatory response, wherever this inflammatory response happens, mesenchymal stem cells the migrate there to counteract this inflammation. In fact, that is what what we have shown in, in later slides. You will see mesenchymal stem cells at the periphery of the granuloma. That means the bugs are establishing the inflammation at the site where the mesenchymal stem cells are coming to rescue this uh, inflammation. That is the host response rather. Right? So anyway, so now what mesenchymal stem cells does in terms of immune response or to establish uh, the uh, susceptibility to, to, to infection so we have done this following experiment. We have taken the C50 and BL6. Of course, this is called jelly. Generally, we take Thai 1.2. Here in this case, we have taken Thai 1.1. And then uh, infected and 30 days uh, later, we isolated mesenchyma stem cells. And then we have taken the Thai 1.2, uh, the Fox P3 ki is the CD4 T cells, the naive CD4 T cells. And then, then infuse that and then the infected with the uh, 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 MTB. And then we looked at the first thing is we looked at the infection. The infection, as you see, the, especially in the early phase, the, it can establish more uh, infection where the more uh, uh, machine chemistry cells are infused. And if you look at the immune response, or the, as you know, this is the regulatory T cells is also upregulated during the progression of the MTV. So, is there any effect on the T regulatory cells? As you see, the animals which received mesenchymal stem cells are produced now more antigen specific. Rather, the one is um, CD4 cells, they are more of T, T regulatory cells. So, from here, we concluded probably the mesenchymal stem cells actually suppresses immune response. And also, it can help in the generation of some kind of anti-regulatory cells. So, when we, uh, you know, send out the paper, the the, the referee had a question: so Can you do something in a in a you know uh, in 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 one experiment? You can do demonstrate all of this. How do you do that? So, what we have uh, done? So, either we have taken uh, uh, B6 mice or the INS knockout mice, and then after 30 days, we have taken out the mesenchymal stem cells and then OT2, TCA transgenic animals, these are the CD4 T cells of these animals, they all are antigen specific to OT2, which is oval, oval uh, uh, antigen specific to come the CD4 T cells and then the for uh, antigen presentation, we need the bone, uh, dendritic cells or the macrophage, we have taken uh, dendritic cells and then mix it up and after mixing up, what we have done is we looked at this uh, uh, if you give them dendritic cells and the OT2 and then uh, the CD4 cells, of course, you will get the proliferative response. Now, if you give them the mesenchymal stem cells from the wild type animal because they are immunosuppressive environment, they create, so they actually inhibit the, the proliferative response in, in, in T cells. And if you take out the mesenchymal stem cells from the INS knockout animals, as you see, it cannot really 
inhibit the proliferation. Once again, suggesting that the mesyl chemical stem cells somehow produce to some kind of nitric oxide that leads to inhibition of the T cell proliferation. So then, what happens? And so far, we have done experimented the in in mouse. So in 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 mouse, can it be extrapolated to the human? But human, we cannot do all these kinds of experiments. But at least we can get at some kind of glands. So for that, what we have done is we collaborated uh, with the Professor Simon Shing at Ames, and from him we got some kind of uh, um, uh, lymph node, uh, you know, uh, tissues. Those who are kind of uh, uh, lymph node tissues from the TB infected uh, uh, human uh, being for the, uh, the lymph node removed because of different reason, and uh, we stayed with uh, with CD29. As you see, this is a B patient, the patient which has TB. They have some kind of uh, at least some uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, which is CD29 positive uh, cells. And if you look at the, then we wanted to look at where is this stem cell cells are sitting. As you see in brown, the mesenchymal stem cells are sitting at the granuloma periphery of the granuloma-like structures. And we have a control which is lymphadenopathy uh, patients. They do not have a granuloma, but huge number of um, uh, and lymphocytes, as you see, there is no structure, granuloma structure, and no mesenchymal stem cells we see. And also, we have activated this uh, uh, lymph node cells with PHA, the another mitogen for the human, um, uh, you know, T cells. And as you see, the they are also very little proliferation um, in response to PHA. Once again, suggesting that probably the mesenchymal stem cells is somehow actually inhibiting the T cell response during at least at the periphery of the granuloma or the local site where the infection is. That is could be the host response, but it's the astute mechanism for for the bugs to survive. This is a kind of a balance between the bugs and the host. And what we describe is as a the when the MTB the uh, the infected. This is the MTB and this is the mesenchymal stem cells they come here and this, this is a because of nitric oxide after that when the mesenchymal stem cells the T cells are at the bay and they are coming to uh, try to come at the site of infection but because of mesenchymal stem cells they cannot come in and that's because of they keep the bay because of production of nitric oxide but nitric oxide amount is not that much it can eliminate the bugs or it can activate the or kind of uh, T cell cannot be uh, activated so the basically, if in any one of the tries to uh, you know cross the barrier with nitric oxide, they can they are uh, being killed. So the obvious question you'll ask me: So how do you get the um, PPD response uh, in, in 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 patients? What we feel, some of the granuloma formation is is a kind of dynamic balance. Some of the granulomas are forming, some of the granulomas are dismissing, and also there could be the active transport of the antigen from the from inside the granuloma. So therefore, the antigen which is coming out, they are taken up by the dendritic cells and the lymph node, you will see the uh, priming of T cells and therefore we get this kind of, uh, you know, uh, PPD uh, response. So that uh, I really don't want to talk about all this. This is a kind of very new thing. So basically people are interested and then made all those uh, headline news, Bayed and other students are all the, in news in all the time. And uh, I know, um, in all headline news is so. Then uh, so so now the question is so that is what exactly I showed. Now the nitric oxide. Uh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, off what lining up. In actually, what happens in nitric oxide synthesis? In, in you have uh, you know uh, knockout animals. They are very susceptible to to MTB infection, and of course, the their granuloma is uh, uh, there is no uh, what do you call it um, in formed granuloma. In mouse itself, they do not have very you know uh, structured granuloma, but in nitric oxide synthesis animals, they do not have any structured granuloma at all. So that is they are very susceptible. In fact. They die within uh, within two weeks. Yeah, yeah, within uh, two, 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 two to three weeks of infection. Anyway, so coming back, so uh, when we have uh, 
I published this paper. Some uh, people from various places, uh, they started uh, replicating our paper and then advanced also. And then people um, have shown this is uh, um, some of the, uh, you know, mesenchymal stem cells, they, uh, you know, uh, are attracted to the site of infection. They, some of the mesenchymal stem cells are also infected. And in fact, some people can infect the uh, mesenchymal stem cells in vitro. And uh, so that, that is what the next paper coming from the uh, Stanford group. So then, now the question is, if mesenchymal stem cells are also infected uh, by, by uh, TB can also infect the mesenchymal stem cells, what the kinetics look like? So in our lab, so in my lab, Samreen uh, Fatima, she has uh, uh, started working on this issue and then we infected uh, either macrophage and mesenchymal stem cells with uh, different numbers of uh, uh, bacteria. As you see, the kinetics is looks like this is a log, uh, uh, log scale. This is the like same thing is in the uh, in linear scale. In log scale, as you see, uh, in, as you see the, the bacteria in macrophages they start growing. They, they they do grow after within 72 uh, 96 hours. The, all the macrophages they now necrotize and then we cannot do no experiment anymore. However. In mesenchymal stem cells, then you see some increase within the 24 to 48 hours, and then they decline. After declination, as you see, because you do the experiment in with the GFP uh, uh, MTV, and you can see up to 15, 20 days actually they they, they uh, live uh, within this uh, uh, stem cells. So the what? But their number never grows, and they, they remain constant is up to we have done experiment up to 20 days and they, their number never gone up. So here is the, as you see, this is the macrophage, this is the stem cell, so the only the uh, few or one or two par, uh, you know, uh, stem cells probably at the most one or two uh, uh, cells you can see that. So then what happens, what is the status of these bugs? Yes. Already we talked about the granuloma, we talked about the latent, latent, of course, for obvious reason. Our interest was um, to look at uh, the what's the status of these bugs. So for this, we have to do a big experiments, several experiments with several T5, uh, you know, um, T75 flask and then take out and then only get only few bugs and take out the uh, RNA and then look at that, uh, the different gene expression, especially with we are looking at the dormancy related uh, gene expression. As you see, the if the macro the, the bugs are coming from the mesenchymal stem cells, there is a, a, a upregulation, all kinds of, uh, of the latency uh, related uh, genes. From here, we conclude that in the mesenchymal stem cells, the cell acquiring uh, the dormancy. So, if you look at the uh, replicative genes, as you see in the macrophage, there is upregulation, but there is no change. In, in replicative genes in, in uh, mesenchymal stem cells. So now, so what are going, what, what are going on? Who is supporting the um, mm, mm, adaptation of these bugs within the mesenchymal stem cells? There must be some host factor. There must be some the uh, bugs factor. So for that we wanted to do various kind of um, uh, gene expression and analysis. What we did is we have infected either uh, uninfected, the H37 RV infected, which is the virulent stem and of course the uh, you know, um, vaccine stem and we wanted to look at the specific gene that leads to the uh, uh, infection, that leads to the generation of granuloma, etc. So we have uh, done this experiment and then we are slowly, we are now um, analyzing the data one by one. The first as you see, what we have seen the some of the quiescence gene is upregulated after MTB infection. So then we wanted to look at the what are the genes and then we really cannot uh, validate all of these genes just because of you know you have to do big experiment with qPCR and validation. So we have done some of the experiment as you see the some of the um, uh, targets like FOXO3 which is responsible to the quiescence, they are really uh, upregulated. Since then we have 
validated this experiment with the not only the Q QPCR but also by the, uh, the Western blot etc. So basically the take home message is after MSC infection the MS MTB acquires the dormancy and what MTB does is the basic famous stem cells they, they induce the quiescence. So basically this is a kind of a hijack mechanism. The, the mesenchymal stem cells now they cannot proliferate their quiescence and they cannot uh, they are not dying and the stem uh, MTB is infected and they are not, not also replicating. So basically it's a kind of dynamic balance they are establishing. They are sitting in there and they uh, live for a long time. So then we wanted to look at the where is this bugs are, how it is happening. So first thing we ask the question where these bugs ended up? The bugs when we did the confocal microscopy, as you see, the, these bugs are more or less like you know, you know, uh, 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 with the kind of a, uh, in a cytosol, and that also we have done with the electron microscopy. As you see, in electron microscopy, this book, these bugs look like they are in, in uh, cytosol. In opposite, in in macrophage, as you see, they are in kind of fibrolysosomal uh, uh, compartment. So basically, the stem cells, the bugs, they do not go to the fibrolysosomal compartment, rather they go in the, in the cytosol. And later on, we have, we know, this is uh, bugs um, uh, in macrophages, they have taken up the phagocytosis, whereas in mesenchymal stem cells, they, they uh, use some kind of uh, receptor. Receptor also, we know this is what kind of receptor they use they taken up uh, because of receptor mediated uptake they ended up going to the cy uh, cytosol which is like a, it almost like a viral uh, take up this entirely different story so we can talk some other time so so in this in, in stem cells during the bugs are in the uh, in the cytosol so how they remain in the cytosol then we we surprisingly what we found there is a huge number of lipid droplet synthesis in the cytosol and then they are kind of a you know uh, uh, you know um, co-localizing with the cytosol and then we did the electron microscopy and in fact we can show the bugs are in the cytosol in the in the in the lipid droplet what it means basically after entering in the mesenchyma stem cells they this bug somehow induced lipid synthesis and after uh, uh, lipid synthesis, they slide into, into the lipid, lipid droplet. What is the physiological advantage of sliding in the lipid droplet? What we feel basically, this is a acute survival mechanism. As you know, the most of the, the almost all the um, uh, uh, organelles in the cells, like mitochondria, um, endoplasmic reticulum, they are the lipid bilayer membrane. And inside there is all everything is happening. And uh, what this bug induces is the synthesis of lipid droplet. Once they inside goes inside the lipid droplet, the cells start thinking. This is basically is our self organ. So cells really cannot kill them. So that is what the this bug is somehow this the uh, use that astute mechanism. So then we started look, looking about how. Uh, is that true? What is the mechanism? We because we have did this mRNA uh, wall sequencing, so we looked at the analysis the data. Indeed, we have seen there is upregulation of all this lipid synthesis gene, and then because of lipid synthesis gene, we have um, uh, we looked at it. We try to inhibit the lipid synthesis by triacin C, which is which can lipid synthesis inhibitor, and what we saw. If we inhibit the, uh, the, uh, the lipid synthesis, there is a you know, down regulation of so RB3134C, uh, which is a kind of a um, regulator of Dave, uh, Davis and Debar. So basically, from here it, con it concludes basically lipid synthesis and the uh, acquisition of dormancy is uh, somehow, somehow uh, coupled. So, therefore, what we did this following experiment once again. This is another experiment. If you do triacin, uh, explode, uh, triacin C, as you see the uh, replicative uh, genes, the replicative genes are upregulated where the triacin C is, um, is given. That means the, the 
acquaintance or acquisition of um, a dormancy is somehow coupled with the lipid synthesis uh, uh, in the mesenchymal stem cells. So therefore, what we can do, we can inhibit uh, the uh, lipid synthesis and can kill that. How we did the experiment with the, as you see, this is the experiment without any kind of uh, um, reagent given or the any treatment given. If we give this as a statin, so there is nothing much because only the few, uh, few mesenchymal stem cells, the bugs are uh, sitting there. If you give INH, of course it clears. But if you give them INH plus statin, the, as you, once again as you see, it is clear. So there is nothing new in it. The, where if you do the experiment with the uh, you know, uh, reactivation experiment, what is the reactivation experiment? You infect and then, then treatment and rest 30 days and then we weaken the immune response by dexamethasone. Dexa what is dexamethasone? Dexamethasone is huh? immunosuppressor. If you give the immunosuppressor, so basically you, you lose the immune response. So basically that gives you the pulse to come back to, to, to their state, proactive state. So in that case, as you see, if you give them isinazide, we get this is huge number of almost 80% the reactivation of the disease. If you give the statin along with it, we very rarely will get uh, that kind of reactivation of the disease. Having said that, so basically one way you can control, probably you can add something uh, in addition to conventional antibiotics, you add uh, uh, the, some kind of statin with it, so that probably you can get better uh, sterile clearance. And how else you can do it? That because the bugs are sitting inside the stem cells, so but the, nobody else can kill it. So only you, you can, and you really cannot target the stem cell. It's very difficult. So what you can do it? You can probably activate this kind of uh, um, um, uh, the stem cells. How do you do that? You can induce autophagy. So then, obvious reason we looked at the autophagy genes, and then we see there is uh, some down regulation of autophagy genes, and so therefore what we did is the, we some kind of try to induce autophagy. If you kind of induce or autophagy, this as in in, in isolated treated mice, as you see, this is initially the the all the uh, replicative genes are some kind of a this is a control. So we the baseline you see the after treatment isolated there is the uh, down regulations of uh, replicative genes. So now if you do inhibit the autophagy, autophagy you can inhibit by some kind of chemical means, since it is the rapamycin. So in macrophage, if you do experiment, with this is the infection, you can get the growth of bacteria. If you, if you inhibit the, uh, with the INH, of course, you can, uh, I, uh, it, uh, uh, where is this? In fact, INH, and this is the carb, of course, you kill all the bacteria. If you kill, I, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, infection with rapamycin, you don't, See, there is some killing, but if you can infection and rapamycin, of course, you do get uh, killing. This is the macrophage. But the story is very different in uh, mesenchymal stem cells. In mesenchymal stem cells, if you, if you see, if you give this um, infection, this is get the, after 48 hours, infection is uh, declined and then remain constant. And if you give them the rapamycin, as you see, rapamycin that actually can activate uh, the mesenchymal stem cells by rapamycin. You, it can kill, eliminate the bacteria, but almost all. But in uh, in macrophage, there is kind of a kind of all of a half of it. And if you give them only uh, uh, INH, as you see, in INH in macrophage, will kill all of the bacteria. But in in mesenchymal stem cells, INH really cannot. Uh, Kill the bacteria. Of course, if you give them together with the rapamycin and INH, although all bacteria have been uh, killed. So basically, now uh, um, what happens is, if can you use that uh, in a in vivo situation? For that work, we have done this experiment. As you see in primary treatment, as you see isinazide, you can see that there's a reduction of bacterial load. In fact, you do not see any uh, you know a bacteria after uh, isolated uh, treatment and rapamycin of course it doesn't do much of it 
and but if you do uh, isomerization prior to rapamycin, of course, this the same as the uh, isomerization. But the only difference, once again, in you see, if you do reactivation experiment exactly the same way we have done before, if the isomerization treated animals, they can get back the reactivate the disease. But if you the animals which are being treated with isomerization plus rapamycin, we really cannot. Um, get back this uh, or reactivate this disease suggesting once again so if you use rapamycin along with conventional antibiotics you can do uh, uh, achieve the steroid clearance so uh, so basically i am almost uh, last uh, couple of more slides so this is unpublished data and this is of course my uh, you know i am collaborating and this is the uh, lead uh, is a rather it's project and what he did is he the same thing with the clofazamine. As you see, the most of the MDR, XDR, they are uh, you know resistant to various drugs. So already in other projects we have shown the MDR, XDR can be eliminated. Also they can be targeted by uh, uh, the uh, clofazamine, which is also another antibiotics, the clofazamine. And if you use the clofazamine along with rap rapamycin, you can perfectly can uh, target uh, both the uh, MDR and uh, XDR uh, treatment that has been down in, uh, uh, shown in, in mouse model and this is uh, Bates data more or less like um, and uh, which is kind of extension of what we are proposing uh, so and I think uh, Bates is going to uh, publish very soon uh, this data. So uh, the, what is the take home message uh, MTB infects in chemistry and so since they still would they go in the cytosol then of course acquire the dormancy and you know, what the MTB the bugs actually enforce the cells to go the quiescence and also they promote the lipid synthesis where the, the bugs slide in the uh, lipid droplet so that they can survive for a, a long time. Co-treatment with the uh, along with the uh, you know, conventional antibiotics with the statin that achieves the sterile clearance so as in the same uh, with the autophagy, the we can do the uh, same thing. So basically, this could be the new approach to uh, treat uh, MDR, XDR. That was the Bates experiment. So, so as one small thing, I would like to mention here. Also, uh, as we have seen, the basic chemistry, the cells are going in the uh, uh, in the cytosol. And if we look at some literature, some of cases in, in dendritic cells where the mature dendritic cells, they do not phagocytose. The cells, they, the MTB can uh, migrate to the cytosol. So if you migrate to the cytosol, they have shown a, uh, from MTB, RD1, ESAT6 is, 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 is somehow responsible for the uh, transmigration from the phago, phagolysis into the uh, cytosol. So we wanted to revisit and then we tried to look at the, if there is any activity of the ESAT6, etc. But we failed. But it doesn't have any, uh, you know, um, homology or the, uh, you know, resemblance with the listerolysine or other lytic proteins. So then we searched the what could be the um, this protein, the ESAT6 may not directly may not be uh, responsible for the transmigration to cytosol. So when we in search of this protein, we have found um, uh, TLOIA, which is RB1694, which is uh, uh, very uh, has a very similar to the um, uh, the uh, uh, Salmonella uh, 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 Steph Staphylococcus aureus, which is the hemolysis. So then we you know for obvious reason we did the experiment. As you see, with the TLOI knockout. As you see, if you TLOI knockout, some of the uh, uh, almost all the bugs they uh, co-localize with the you know uh, Rab5 and lamp one whereas in the H37 RV the many of these cells they do not co-localize suggesting they give the cytosol and we have done electron microscopy and the electron microscopy also suggests that the sum of the bacteria in the come out in the cytosol in H37 RV but in TLO and knockout they really uh, cannot uh, come out and then we looked at and uh, uh, tested the previous data with RD1 knockout as RD1 knockout also really uh, cannot come out so basically and if we 
put back the RD1 once again if they, they can come out, suggesting that RD1 also the, shows the same phenomenon. So there must be some link between the RD1 or the ESAT6 with the uh, TLYA. For that we did the following experiment and also we did same experiment with the with in electron microscopy. If the message is the same. So basically now we wanted to look at where this TLYA and what is the relation with the uh, ESAT6 with, with TLYA. And surprisingly what we have seen in H37RB TLY is secreted out in a kind of a uh, like a pod factor and TLY as you see this is uh, not out we don't see such, such kind of structure and we wanted to look at who are these um, uh, strains have this TLY as you see the cDNA is there in both genome of DNA and cDNA there is but in, in uh, uh, RD1 knockout or TLY knockout we don't see this is at 6 this is the IP experiment to, with uh, Western, uh, you know, with anti TLY antibody and immunoprospirate, and then, uh, you know, probe with the ESAT 6. So, basically, if we can uh, try to uh, probe immunoprospirated, uh, immunoprospirated with that type uh, TLY, we can uh, co immunoprospirate with ESAT 6. That is their physically interactive. So, then we did the reconstitution experiment. If we put back the RD1 is in BCG as you see this is some of the things it can be uh, seen in the surface it is very prominent in uh, RD1 reconstruction experiment and uh, so basically from here uh, we have uh, take home messages MTB translocated in the cytosol in the macrophage also and the TLY is essential for cytosolic translocation and somehow ESAT6 is the acid uh, assist which is almost like a uh, chevron and the uh, expression of and secretion of TLO is uh, critically dependent on the uh, ESAT6. And this is all uh, what I uh, talked about today. Machine fiber stem cells um, provide niche for, for niche for the uh, empty latent infection. Macrophage is the natural uh, host for the um, MTV. This is known for uh, you know decades. Uh, and whereas we are the addition is whereas machine stem cells are the na natural host for uh, latent or dormant TB. MTB acquires dormancy uh, in, in uh, machine stem cells, but MTB enforces machine stem cells to acquire quiescence. Unlike macrophages, MTB directly enters in the cytosol in MSCs. MTB induces lipid droplets in MSCs and when it resides in this new uh, lipid droplets. Once again, to emphasize, the basically the um, this is the astute mechanism for the MTB to synthesize lipid droplet and slide in there where the you know where uh, this lipid droplet the cell take is our self organelle and this lipid lipid can be as a carbon source for the survival of this uh, uh, bacterium. So uh, at the last but not least, of course, uh, uh, the here sitting is of course the bed and the bed who has done a lot of experiment and helped all my uh, various PhD students and, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Pawan Sharma, uh, the, he was my mentor, he is till date he keeps on guiding me what to do, what not to do, not only in science but also in general, general sphere of my uh, growth and uh, uh, in, in life perspective and uh, the first part of work is done by Shilpa is a long time back. I had to talk about this data to continue what we are doing is and later on Shamreen continued this data and the, all the um, uh, transmigration data this is uh, you know uh, done by the Ijaz Rahman and uh, grants from various uh, sources welcome trust uh, DBT and CSIR and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, see, some of the mechanism we are still working on it. Basically, what we feel basically MTB after in entering the mesenchymal stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells imposes uh, 
some factors on it so that they do not replicate and that leads to the mm, you know inhibition of uh, replication at the same time if we have um, the mtb secretes something so that they can interact with the, this is basically protein protein interactions and that leads to the the mtb do not is not killed at the same time that um, you know uh, uh, at the same time mtb is not being replicated so that is what is a dynamic balance right now is it uh, what we are working out is the what are the factors in the mesenchymal stem cells interact with the factors that uh, uh, in, in by the bugs so there's physical interactions we do not know the yet but definitely uh, we are working on it yeah a very good question so basically what happens is so all this is a immune pressure the bugs are hiding in a cell type because of immune pressure so I can imagine that some of the um, secret factors like interferon gamma TNF IL-1 the probably is somehow responsible uh, on the infected cells so that the cells are maintaining in that status when you take out these factors, the bugs, the genetic now has a free hand. They try to replicate and then they will burst and they will come back and then reinfect the other cells. So, but what are the factors right now? It's a very barren field. Actually, as you know, this is macrophage infection is in MTB is almost like more than 50 years now. But in stem cell, in, in and the uh, MTB infection is very, very new field. Whatever you do is a new. And uh, after our paper, this is uh, sometime, you know, uh, two, three years, people, uh, you know, thought. Then all of a sudden I see there are many, many groups who started working on it. That, um, you know, um, including in, in India, there are uh, several groups are working on this uh, uh, stem cells now. Yeah. So that uh, that means you are trying to say this uh, like a uh, uh, exosomes kind of thing, uh, kind of a. I we we haven't done that kind of experiment, and also very is very difficult to do that kind of experiments. Thus, uh, uh, basically, uh, in vitro one can design experiment. You can infect mesenchymal stem cells and then isolate exosome and then infect the fresh batch of cells. Is is. It's very difficult. Although we have done, we have done recently what we have done. Uh, yeah, recently we have done it. We have isolated um, in, uh, chemist, yeah, the exosome from the mesenchymal stem cells, exosome from the macrophage, and then we did all sequencing, and we can see there is uh, MTB proteins in there. You know, uh, genes there. In fact. When we have done that uh, proteomics, we, we can see some proteins. Whether this is because of live bug or, or it's because of, uh, you know, protein exported, that we really do not know yet. But this is a very good question, yeah. It's a wonderful uh, talk and uh, I learned a lot. And it's a comprehensive talk, I would say. But I have a question that, uh, uh, say, a lot of people, in the case of other bugs, Pseudonas, Sessorius, they are trying to do the MSC mediated, uh, uh, say, antibacterial activity. They are using it uh, and they have shown it that the uh, MSC secretes uh, some of the microbial, antimicrobial peptides and they attack on the, uh, these 
SRS, you know, Sarajana Sa. Would you like to see it in the case of MT? Well, I mean, uh, I can tell you, and uh, I'll answer the question two ways. Number one, in depending on the kind of inflammation, I can see that this, um, in fact, uh, uh, another Dr. Das in, in IMR, and uh, uh, they have done experiment with the missing chemical stem cells also infiltrated in malaria infection. But their uh, behavior of missing chemical stem cells is very different depending on the types of inflammation you set up. Uh, so number one. So basically whether this missing chemical stem cells will work in for uh, killing the bugs that we do not know. But certainly this missing chemical stem cells restrict the growth of MTV, that we can say. So number one. Number two, uh, a group um, in uh, Sweden, after our paper, they, what they did is they uh, tried to uh, modify the machine chemical stem cells. So basically, they are uh, you know treating the machine chemical stem cells and then uh, putting in the uh, you know M MDR uh, patients to look at if there is any efficacy. They can actually inhibit the proliferation or the replication of the bars. They uh, actually uh, clinical uh, trial data is out. Also in Bangalore based company uh, they are uh, you know uh, I am often consulting with them. They are consulting me with me rather. They are what they are doing is they are taking out the machine chemical stem cells from the patient and treating with uh, uh, different kinds of stimuli and they are reprogramming the machine chemical stem cells and fusing back in patients. So that is also is going on. So or take home messages to uh, summarize your question. Yes, basic chemical stem cells can be used for uh, the uh, you know treating bugs, but it, it, it has to be uh, uh, programmed very differently. And then uh, say there are uh, the second question, if uh, personally, if it is allowed, if there is a time. So MSC is a, has a role in autophagy also, right? So now, would you like to use uh, MSCs? Can also be used. It can be used for the dissemination of the bug also, or maybe it can be used for the as a good medicine also to kill the TB. So what do you think? So uh, 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 if I uh, understood your question correctly, in one of the slides we have shown, if you can induce autophagy, autophagy is one of the mechanism to eliminate the uh, TB. That's well established. And if you can induce autophagy in the stem cells, probably you can eliminate the bugs from, uh, from the missing kind of stem cells. So therefore, when we have done in vivo experiment as well, in in vivo experiment what we see, if we give the rapamycin along with the conventional antibiotics, you can induce, actually you can achieve steroid uh, clearance. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Nice for the new sense of very good learning, which is how you started this MSC field. And so, like, what do for me at least, not, not coming from a TV background, <laughs> but yeah, from the Akla Chalo to Karma Panta, yeah, that's a good story. But something which I want to know means, what is the lipid, what type of lipid is inside? Is this is known, what is the lipid? Uh, see, I mean, I mean, it's just to add again, second thing, and yeah. just to work it. Yeah, very uh, and, what, and what is the target of this statin? In MTV. See, this is uh, once again, um, I do not have answer. Mm -hmm. That's because you know, this field is so new, so barren. Mm -hmm. Only started uh, people working right now. I mean, in my lab, we are doing some of the things, it's not possible to do all of the things. But these are the questions, of course, one can definitely answer. But you know, uh, okay. we haven't done this. And second part, are there any clinical data known that the people who are already on statin yes. are less susceptible, susceptible to glucosis? Yes, actually there is a huge cl clinical, uh, you know, um, uh, clinical trial is going on. One is from um, uh, that, um, hey, um, um, that uh, Amit uh, guy. Uh, Amit Singhal, uh, they are uh, uh, Singapore, they are also uh, doing the uh, clinical trial. Another trial from somewhere in Europe, they are uh, actually uh, statin and plus uh, 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 you know, conventional antibiotics. 
and also huh? right uh, yeah, and also uh, if you look at the compile the data those who are taking the uh, statins they are less susceptible for TB infection that's data already is uh, well published well known but nobody knew the mechanism probably we are talking about the mechanism for the first time yeah Uh, thank you, sir, for your insightful lecture. Actually, my question was almost similar. That have you checked the memory response uh, when you treated against statin or lepamycin? Memory response. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, your uh, uh, question is uh, no, uh, but uh, that didn't cross our mind. That's because. Um, we never thought about this as a vaccine angle. So, because you are talking about vaccine angle, I understand. So, for that, we had a diff we have a different program where we are looking at it. But this didn't cross our mind. No, we haven't seen it. Yeah. Anti. Uh, we haven't, we, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, used any other drug other than two things we tried. One is uh, uh, inducing autophagy. That's because our, uh, when we did this um, experiment with the um, all sequencing experiment, what we found, there are two things. One lipid synthesis pathway and this autophagy pathway. So therefore, we targeted uh, either uh, you know, with the uh, uh, lipid synthesis or, or statin or uh, the inducing autophagy. There are two things. Mm -hmm. So, we haven't done any other uh, 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 target, no. And second, sir, did we investigate the effect of uh, nitrogen monoxide on erythropoietin? Because nitrogen monoxide will reduce the uh, level of oxygen and it will also promote the erythropoietin. Erythropoietin stimulate the bone marrow. And, uh, again, we have adequate level of uh, T cells. Well, we haven't done all those experiments. This is, you know, the field is so new. I am sorry, I, I kept on saying no, no, no. That's because, okay. so that's because of that's because of the field is so new. Because uh, most of the experiments are not done. See, if you look at the literature in macrophage field, you will see the data, fifty thousand papers. If you look at the uh, stem cell data, only uh, 20, 30 papers so far. So basically, the lot of things can be done. A, whatever you do, it's a new. So the, either this uh, very similar to the macrophage or be different to the macrophage. So there are a lot of ex things yet to be done. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. One last question. Like, uh, since you said... No, that last question. <laughs> they will decide. Oh, okay. the, it's the last question. Uh, I mean, from my side, yes. Uh, I wanted to know, like, uh, if TB... Uh, I think two major challenges that cause severity and intensity for the disease is one is what is said about the MTB and another is a slow growing of this mycobacterium to uh, this mycobacterium. So I am asking uh, what is the, why it is a slow growing bacteria like if we know the mechanism or uh, the reason behind this we can design or uh, like good strategy to tackle this uh, challenge. Yeah, this is, uh, um, uh, see, this is uh, most of the drugs so far, uh, you know, developed uh, to treating the any, uh, you know, infectious organism, majority of them are for replicating bugs. Yes, the, the uh, MTB is very slow replicating bugs and you take, uh, you have to take medication for a long time. That is also uh, true. But if you, at the other, uh, other side, if you look at the leprosy is even the most uh, slow growing drug then if you take other drugs you can you can uh, basically you can treat the, the uh, leprosy if the leprosy do not come back but if you withdraw drug the mtv only uh, comes back right thank you sir any other question no yeah, yeah sure please <laughs> thank you so much sir for a very interesting and enlightening lecture so I am uh, curious if you can enlighten us that what is the possible role of these MSCs?
during co-infection with either be COVID or HIV. With oh. TB, COVID and HIV. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, probably you are one of the uh, person who have in, uh, in when, when I was in South Africa, one data we never could, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, e extrapolate or we could uh, do any more experiment. Where we have found the HIV particle is in the mesenchyma stem cells in semen. So basically, probably the mes the uh, um, MSC is the hiding place not only for this uh, MTV but could be other uh, uh, infectious pathogen as well. And in fact other papers are also coming in various other uh, infection including leishmania. The probably the mesenchyma stem cells make a niche for the uh, uh, survival of latent uh, bugs. So, the coming back to your question, so that the mesenchyma stem cells can have a role in the HIV infection, there could be, but we do not know it, but we have a small piece of data, probably you are one of the uh, uh, persons who work on it with their prayer. And uh, from data from other infections, yes, there could be, but uh, not extensively worked out and people are, you know, Doing, uh, uh, a lot of people are working on this, uh, these aspects and of course the various aspects, right? So any other question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question. Yeah. Yeah. There are, uh, this is, uh, this is not the, uh, there, eh? there are uh, the drag, drag pipeline for uh, TB, there are uh, several actually. But not the uh, uh, is, I think, uh, uh, yes, latest one is the beta coiline that we know. Uh, latest, latest one is the beta coiline. But Probably that question can be answered expert like you with the medicinal <laughs> chemistry and also that uh, MT. Well, I mean the uh, field is like this. Mm, in fact, for treating any uh, 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 infectious bugs, uh, monotherapy is not allowed. This is almost all the infections that we have to do with the you know uh, multiple uh, uh, antibiotics so that that's uh, true in tb of course nobody wants nobody wants to take a risk so anything you do sir no uh, how you do the clinical trial if the monotherapy is not allowed so basically especially do new drug so basically you have to do along with the other uh, conventional uh, antibiotics that is what probably the one drug is not sufficient or rather one drug is not allowed. So. Okay. There is no further question. So thank you so much sir Thanks. for such an intriguing lecture. We are really fortunate to get to learn about TB immunology from a pioneer like you. I am sure that everyone has enriched by the lecture is present here. It was really a pleasure to get to know to, uh, TB immunology. It was it was a pleasure for us to have you among us here. Now I would like to invite Dr. Veet Prakash Devaki to present a memento to Dr. Das.
education and for that our first speaker is Dr. Haruka Yoshi, application scientist, Kaling, Sweden. Her main research focus has been analyzing the physical and mechanical properties of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition during cancer metastasis. Today she is going to talk more about her research through her talk on 3D bioprinting. Now all over sir. All. Study 
viral infection, uh, infection studies. So in this case, first design 3D model. Uh, this uh, model is three layer uh, structure. As you can see, they use two different materials to uh, create construct composed of three layer. After they, they design the model, they choose the bio material that they are uh, going to print with. So they again use the two materials, bio one and two. And both of them have uh, the same uh, biomaterials, alginate base, um, alginate, gelatin, collagen, and calcium sulfate. But the difference between these two bio inks are the, the, the cells that they encapsulated with. So for the bio ink one, they encapsulated lung carcinoma cells. And for bio ink two, they encapsulated two different cell types, uh, lung cytoplasm, and they uh, also had a leukemia cell. And they, in this case, they have these cells mixed in with inks, so, uh, so they performed cell laden uh, cell printing. I mean, they actually performed bioprinting without a bioprinter. And then they incubated some time before they move on to the uh, downstream analysis. So, for downstream analysis, they did uh, some viability to see how cells survive in structure. And they maintained um, cells uh, up to 35 days in the printed construct. They also looked at metabolic activity. And they were able to see that high uh, metabolic activity remained throughout this um, 35 days. And they also looked at uh, some morphology and certain protein using some staining. Additionally, they did uh, inflammatory uh, response uh, and also viral infections. So for inflammatory response, they added LPS followed by ATP stimulation. And then also they did viral infection studies. Uh, for a viral infection study, they inoculated the printed construct with uh, influenza seasonal, uh, influenza A viral strain. So for inflammatory response, uh, they looked at alpha uh, uh, one beta, and they saw that release of this ER from inflammatory cytokine. And then for viral infections, uh, they added um, antiviral drug, and they actually saw the inhibition of viral growth with increasing the concentration of antiviral drugs. So they were able to see both uh, inflammatory response and viral infection and inhibition of the, uh, the viral growth with the increasing concentration of antiviral drugs. So they did this drug testing on this printed construct. So this study shows that uh, this uh, flexibility and uh, that it can work with many different um, Settings. So they did uh, culture the cells in 3D and they used multiple cell types. And they, for the post print process, they did LPS stimulation and they also did a viral inoculation. And then they are able to perform a different analysis and assay. Uh, for example, they did look at uh, cell viability and they also looked at uh, metabolic activity and they did flag assays to look at the viral infection. And the key finding from this study is that they saw that uh, they actually saw the 3D uh, culture cells had better uh, cell liability in long-term cultivation after 35 days. And immune response was observed and also inhibition of virus uh, with antiviral drugs in a dose-dependent manner was observed. And in this example, they use this uh, grid-like structure, so they use the structure, but you can also uh, use the uh, more complicated designs. For example, in this, and in this case, customers did um, print uh, artificial cornea model. And for this, they use actual human cornea to model this 3D uh, cornea structure. And they created this frame-like structure. They further printed in this uh, frame structure that is uh, uh, 
developed from the uh, human model. And then they, for the five weeks, they actually use collagen and algae and also keratocytes. And then they printed the structure. So you can print for the cells, and also, uh, so you can have a uh, low density of cells, a small host of cells, but some of the customers actually preform these steroids and then mix the steroids with biomaterial, use this bioink and print steroids. So this is one of the examples of customers in Australia printed steroids. And what's interesting is that they saw the steroids are fused together within the printed construct. And in this case also they again saw the high cell viability and they in this case, they mix this um, cardiomyocyte fibroblast to create this heart, um, heart steroids. So they also had endothelial cells, and they were able to see angiogenesis. And they also saw the steroid feeding, which is characteristic of the heart. Another example uh, of our customers um, Application, they used a neuron crescent cell uh, mixed with gelatin and they were able to um, do this uh, pattern. So cells uh, induce the uh, cell growth in the pattern as you can see here. And some also bacteria cells can be printed as well. So in this example, they use the bacteria cells as a microbial fuel. So using 3D bioprinting technology, they were able to localize cells on electronics. And these electroactive cells were able to uh, help uh, catalyze the reaction. And then they saw the uh, increase in additive production, which they wanted to see. And for this experiment uh, specifically, they also used a bio ink, alginate based bio ink with a cell wall pattern, and they were able to print the bacteria cells. And although I did uh, mainly focus on the cell uh, containing uh, by printing, there are also customers uh, do use our technology for soft robotic applications using magnetic nanoparticles. With magnetic nanoparticles, you can have this uh, create a construct that is responsive a magnetically responsive uh, uh, construct. And also having a magnetic nanotube, you can uh, create electroconductive material. So in this case, uh, this uh, material can be used as sensor. It can sense the bending of the finger. And there's also customers use a uh, thermal responsive material. So now I'd like to talk about the challenge in digital engineering. One of the challenges in digital engineering is that when you are culturing the cells in 3D, you have a stack of cells. This is quite different from when you're culturing cells in 2D monolayer. So the system needs to deliver oxygen nutrients, remove weight, uh, but it, it can be more difficult compared to 2D system, as now you have a uh, thickness. And then typically, uh, you have this, um, the, the gradient of this oxygen, oxygen and nutrient, and the, the thickness, the limit, is set to be about 200 micrometer in the absence of temporary network. So then you will end up with these dead cells that are not getting these enough oxygen and nutrients. And this is where the vascularization uh, comes in. Vascularization can be very important, and many researchers are now looking into this uh, vascularized uh, construct. So this is one of the examples where customers printed, uh, created this muscle tissue in plants, uh, fully vascularized. So they have this uh, vascularized uh, structure and they implanted into the uh, injury site of the animal and they saw again angiogenesis and they saw the muscle uh, regeneration. So how do you create uh, this channel-like structure? So uh, after you create a channel-like structure, you can, create, uh, you can see um, endothelial cells, like human cells, and to 
mimic this uh, vascular structure in our body. But to create this uh, vascular, like a uh, channel like hollow tube structure, you can first print with the base material, and then you can print a channel like structure with what we call sacrificial ink. And then you can do the rest of the structure with the same material as the base material. And then once the base material is shown in yellow is cured, you can remove the sacrificial ink and then leaving this whole tube-like structure behind. And that's how you can create the sacrificial, uh, you can create channel-like structure. Using this, many researchers now do um, a channel-like structure and uh, microfluidic devices. And then Microfluidic devices, you can also create an organ on a chip model. For example, lung on a chip, brain on a chip, heart on a chip, etc. So these are spirit samples. I'd like to introduce uh, spirit samples that customers use our technology to do organ on a chip type of models. So in this example, they created a tumor on a chip. So they have this percussible channel, but they also have a cancer cell. So cancer cell line are printed, and also endothel uh, endothelial cell line printed. So using this kind of device, you can look at how cancer cells migrate within this uh, channel or within this uh, device. This is another example. In this case, endothelialized myocardium on the chip. So they printed with a cardiomyocyte, and they had again channel-like structure, and they were uh, they put this printed structure onto the microfluidic device, and they added drug as uh, they had this channel-like structure, and they compared. So without um, those roots in, they see a little bit more con uh, contraction. With those uh, roots in, they see less uh, contraction, which is expected. So using this uh, microfluidic device or uh, organ and chip model, they can also do drug testing. And they also implanted this printed structure into the animal as well. So with the printed constructs, you can do all sorts of different kind of experiments, uh, downstream processes, animal implantations, um, Microfluidic type of device, organ and chip type of device, um, drug screen, and so on. So all these examples that I've shown uh, up till now are used of uh, extrusion-based bioprinters. So in the next uh, few slides, I will uh, talk about uh, extrusion-based bioprinters, especially focusing on BioX and BioX6. So, all of our extrusion based eye printer is using a pneumatic system. So the air pressure push ink out of the nozzle to extrude ink out. So our flagship eye printer, BioX, these are the, some of the key features. So we have clean chamber technology. So we have germicidal UV and also we have um, HEPA filter. So these two together will uh, allow to create Sterile environment within the inner chamber. And we also have three exchangeable print heads, and we have a multiple UV curing system for the customers using multi uh, UV curing material like uh, methacrylated uh, gelatin, collagen, and so on. And we also have pretty bad temperature control. We can uh, operate between 4 degrees to 60 degrees. Again, some of the customers using uh, temperature sensitive material, gelatin, matrix gel, collagen. And we have this is an touch screen with a very easy user friendly software. And this will make a uh, BioX a standalone unit. And the next slide, I'd like to talk about this uh, three exchangeable print heads. So the print head can be easily attached and detached onto this device. It's magnetically attached and detached. And we offer different print heads. Pneumatic print head, and also we have temperature control. Some of them for the uh, electromagnetic droplet uh, is similar to inkjet printing, like the droplet printing. 
from a blessing printhead, a printing from the material that mounts at high temperature, from a blessing material, and the syringe pump printhead for curing forehead. So this is how the, our pneumatic printhead prints. We also have syringe printhead for more precise volume control. We also have inkjet type of printing to print drop flat. And we also have the photo curing tool head for more controlled after curing processes after printing. And then our newest extrusion printer model 5x6 have additional three print heads. So now you have six print heads. And we also have tablet to operate the software. And we also have a coaxial printing platform. So for coaxial printing, uh, you can have two materials extruding at the same time from one nozzle. So as you can see here, outer layer and inner layer. So in this case, you can see our outer layer is clear uh, ink and inner layer, the red ink. So it's printing coaxial, using coaxial model. So as you can see, outer layer clear uh, ink and inner layer red ink is coming out together. And with Biolite 6 model, you can do this coaxial model printing. So using, uh, using this BioX6, this is an application note, you can create a more complicated uh, skin model. So skin composed of epidermis, uh, epidermal layer, dermal layer, and hypodermal layer. You can mimic the skin structure using BioX6. So again, BioX6 can have up to six print heads, so you can create vascular type of structure using coaxial nozzle. But you can also have different layers, uh, hypodermal layer having pre-adipocyte cells, and also you can have a dermal layer having fibroblast and humic cells. You can also have the uh, epidermal layer having melanocytes. So as you can see, you can have different type of cells with different type of inks and different type of printing mode, different type of print heads to create more complicated structure. And this can be also used for drug screening type of assay. So this, in this example, customer printed using our extrusion based pipe printer to print this small disk containing uh, cancer cells. And they printed it onto the uh, multi well plate directly. And they create, uh, and they did perform 3D uh, drug testing. They compared this result with the monolayer, as shown here. So they used uh, three drugs for nine different concentrations, and for each condition, they are three replicates. And in this uh, study, they used actually our bio ink. Uh, from one milliliter of our bio ink, they were able to create 50 samples. And for the bio ink, they used an uh, alginate based bio ink, and the LGG uh, added to this ink. So, when going back to the bio printing workflow, this choosing of bio ink and material is very important and crucial part of uh, 3D bio printing technology. And as I mentioned earlier, since we started as a bio ink company, we offer many different types of bio ink. And in different forms as well, some of them are powder forms, so you can make your own bio to the concentration of your like. But you can also, we also have the ready to use bio ink that are tested with uh, cell viability already. So you can just mix with cells and start printing. So in this example, customers study as uh, mix our bio ink with leukemia cells. And Again, we offer many different bio inks. So this one is alginate based bio ink, but we have different uh, formulations. Some of them have RGD added, some of them have laminin added, and even laminin added ones, we have different laminin. So in this case, customers used uh, primary uh, B cells and also cell line using our alginate based bio ink.
This is another example of immune studies. So this is our application note. But in this case, they printed a droplet containing a tumor cell. And they co-cultured with a T cell. And then they looked at, they performed T cell cytotoxicity assay. And they saw that increasing T cell concentration, they saw that the viability of tumor cell decreased. They also performed a immune checkpoint assay. And with the blockage, they saw that survival of tumor cell decreased, showing the immune cells killing activity increased. So in this specific example, we printed the tumor model, tumor containing droplet for the assays, like T cell cytotoxicity assay, immune checkpoint assays. So if you want to perform even higher throughput assays, we have a BioSol X biodispenser. This is for high throughput automated dispensing. So with this, you have a pre-validated protocol. So very easy to print a droplet type of test. So you can create droplet. Using this technology, this is especially good for high throughput assay screening. And it works with collagen. So you can have cells encapsulated in collagen and do droplet. So you can do just a droplet, but you can also do droplet in droplet. By having one type of cells in the inner droplet, you can also study the cell migration. Another cell migration example is like this. You can do a line. So you can see how one cell is tied in one structure, migrate into the other line. So this is you can do with our biodispenser, BioSol X. So let's go back to the microfluidic organ and chip device. You're creating this channel-like structure. And some of the customers would like to use, would like to have a little smaller, even smaller channel-like structure. For smaller, more complicated structure, we have our light-based bioprinter for high-resolution bioprinting. So I'm going to first introduce our LumenX, our light-based bioprinter, to create more complex, intricate, smaller structure. So LumenX uses this light-based printing technology. So a light comes in and then hit the photopurable material, photo ink, or biomaterial, and then the structure gets printed. So this is how LumenX prints the structure. As you can see, the structure gets printed on this black part. It's kind of printed upside down manner. So the structure hangs from this. So using this, you can create a big intricate structure. So for example, this one is printed with a LumenX and vessel exchanger model. So you have these two independent vessel-like structures as shown in blue and as shown in red. And these are interwined but not physically connected structures. So these are two independent channels, but because these are hydrogels, uh, when you perfuse oxygen or fluid and nutrients, the exchange of the material can happen with the time by then traveling through these hydrogen uh, hydrogel network. Another example is this uh, alveolar sac model. So in this case, you can have the air pumping into the central sac model, and then the surrounding sac model, you have this um, vascular structure. So vascular structure, you can perfuse the red blood cells around. Then now you have a vascularized alveolar sac model. You can even have several um, in, the, in the construct to have more complicated structure. So 
In another example, this is actually a publication from a customer, they modeled a human heart using the embryonic heart and fetal heart, and they uh, printed with luminex, and they cultured with cubic cells, and they connected to the perfusion, perfusion system to culture the cells in a dynamic system. And with luminex also, you can do uh, live cell printing. So this is one of the examples from customers where they used uh, a gsc derived uh, cells, a cardiomyocytes, mixed with biopic, and they printed live cells. If you want to even go a more uh, higher resolution, we also have BioNova X for uh, high, high resolution web printing, but also high throughput printing. With BioNova X, uh, we can reach uh, 10 micrometer resolution, and we can again do the live cell printing. And also, you can do direct in well printing up to 24 well plates, so you can do this high throughput type of printing using light-based uh, printing technology. And we, of course, uh, have a bio-ink and consumable. So in summary, 3D bio printing technologies uh, offer design flexibility. You can, you can have organ-specific models. You can do droplet printing as a as a sphere printing, and you can also have a vascular model and different uh, forms. You can have mesh, or you can even have tablet for some uh, drug studies, implant. Some of the customers actually do patch or microfluidic device, and you can also do sensors for some robotic application. And for the applications, organ models and high throughput drug screen, toxicology studies. We can also have different disease models, infectious disease models, cancer model, uh, tumor on a chip model, lung on a chip model. And a bio ink, you can use different variety of uh, bio inks and material, gelatin based, collagen based, uh, alginate based are common ones, but some of them actually use chitosan based thermoplastic material, and also ceramic and superficial ink. And then you can add other biological component to the bioink as well, antibiotics or um, uh, drug uh, pharmaceutically uh, relevant component as well, synthetic peptide as well, and nanoparticles, both nanoparticles, graphene, and you can use various cell types, uh, IKC drug cells, um, primary cells, immune cells, and you can also do sterile uh, type of bioprinting as well. If you are interested in our uh, product, uh, please check our website, but all, you can also contact our sales manager. He's located in India, so you can contact him directly. And that's all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, ma'am. You have introduced us to the world of bioprinting as you have like introduced us to tumor on chip model, organ on chip, and bacterial bioprinting as well. I want to know whether by using this uh, bioprinting, we can structure a 3D granuloma, which is a characteristic feature of tuberculosis in which bacteria hides inside and the immune cells, you know, completely uh, uh, are covering the bacteria. So that can be used to study drug efficacy assays in case of TB. I do agree with that you can definitely use, uh, of course, it, it will depend on the uh, material you use. First of all, the material used has to be compatible with the, the cells that you are using. So the cells, you have to test the cell viability, but also the structure, what kind of structure you want to create, and the resolution of the structure as well. But if you design properly, 
the structure as well as the bio material. And if you optimize bio printing, you can certainly study. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for the insightful talk. My question is, um, how do you see the progression of disease in the case of bioprinted models and the real human models? Uh, like, uh, what are the uh, difference in the results of both in both cases? Sorry, I'm having a little difficult time uh, hearing you. Can you speak closer to the microphone, maybe? Hello, um, am I audible? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hello. So I, I had a little hard time uh, hearing your question. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, ma'am. Ma ma my question is, how do you see the progression of disease in the case of bioprinted models and in the case of real uh, human model or some other live model? What are the difference between the results of both the cases? Bam, the difference between the uh, bioprinted models and the human cases, human models, uh, like how, how is, what is the progression of disease in both the cases when you infect, uh, when you infect uh, or you use it uh, for the experimental purpose? human body so I'm sure the results will vary but the idea uh, key things here is that it definitely uh, clo more closely mimic the human nature than the 2D culture as you are creating your culture and self in 3D space and also this will depend how closely you mimic the structure will depend on the or for the structure you print or structure you design and so a uh, more complicated structure, of course, you can uh, reach closer to the actual model. But in terms of actual testing, this will really depend on the researcher. As you, as I shown you in this uh, in the presentation, downstream processes, uh, customers do different kind of uh, downstream processes, imaging, and some of them do a PCR type of test. So they break down the construct and take out uh, the cells and then do the further analysis. Some of them actually implant into the animal and then see progression. And some of them do a little bit of shorter um, analysis, like a week, but some of them do over uh, 30 days. So this really depends on the um, study you want to perform. Uh, as a as I've shown you, this is a very flexible uh, platform, so it can work with many different kind of uh, studies and platforms, so it really depends on the researchers, how they develop the design, the experiment. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. So, in this session, our next speaker is Dr. Paras Yadav, a field application scientist, South Asia, Nano Stream Technologies, USA. Dr. Paras has developed expertise in a wide range of molecular biology technology like microarray, a variety of NGS techniques and spatial genomics technology for a diverse range of applications like gene expression, genotyping, molecular cytogenetics, etc. His today's talk focused on nanostring technologies catalyze the next revolution using spatial biology. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Dr. Wave, 
and his team for this invitation. I'm Paris from NanoStrength and uh, today I'm going to talk about very exciting technology from NanoStrength. And uh, as far as NanoStrength is concerned, NanoStrength is a US based company uh, headquartered in Seattle, founded in 2003. In 2008, they launched their first product, which is known as Encounter Analysis Platform. This is a great success in the field of genomics because it uh, does a unique way of uh, it offers a unique way of gene expression analysis. Secondly, uh, this is the technology which in fact do the analysis of RNA, DNA, and proteins together. In fact, of the same samples you can analyze the three things together. Riding on the success of Encounter Platform, there is another technology launched by NanoString which is a special biology and this is a very exciting technology I can say because this is the technology which can look look upon the heterogeneity of the tissues in fact. It can go back and look the things in a, in a special manner in fact. So two exciting technology and uh, basically my talk is totally on the technology but let's see how we can uh, use this technology in fact in the workflow which you are using, uh, you know, doing day by day in the in the laboratory in fact. So full respect to these three technologies which we are using commonly from last couple of I would say from few decades in fact for gene expression analysis, qPCR, micro NGS, we all know these are great technologies in fact. But I want to also discuss about the challenges which has been associated with these three different technologies in fact and it has to be discussed in fact because they are important. So first of all the quality of sample is very very important. If I do any experiments the quality of sample is very important then somehow if the quality is not good in fact we are adding some kind of errors into the data in fact which are generated. And somehow the quality is not good so either we have to re-extract the samples or we have to compromise the samples we don't have the samples to, to you know um, to replace the samples in fact. So basically somehow we are introducing some kind of errors in the data because of the bad quality samples. Right. Secondly the pipetting steps if you know the work of micro NGS there are you know it's almost you know one and a half days protocol we have to follow and we know more the steps more the variations we are introducing into your data it happens right. And third the important part is the use of enzymes. So we know the enzyme efficiency does not remain the same throughout the experiments, I mean throughout the multiple experiments. We also know the fact that RT enzyme which itself is a you know highly muted, mutant enzyme in fact and if we compare with between the vendors also between different companies the RT enzyme efficiency also does not remain the same. Thirdly amplification efficiency, polymerase is great, polymer is great but in fact we also know the fact that with the time efficiency goes down and also the efficiency of the polymerase enzyme does not remain the same for all the targets. So if I talk about NGS and microarray, we are dealing with thousands of transcripts at the same time. So there, therefore we can believe it that the enzyme efficiency does not remain the same for all the targets. For some targets great, some targets not so much great in fact, right. So somehow we are introducing some kind of biasness into the data because of those factors in fact. Another is analog data. So we know analog and digital. Analog means converting the fluorescence into the values. So cyber green and micro is side three side five type. What we do we convert the fluorescence into the values. Okay. So that also can reduce some kind of errors because it's not always 100 percent efficiency efficiency that shows for to convert the uh, fluorescence into the values. RNA seq, yes, it's a digital technology, it counts the number of copies. Right. The last which is very, very important because once we get the data, we have to do the analysis, right? So it's not easy in fact always to get the right housekeeping genes for your experiments and seriously it's not easy right. So we have to look out the housekeeping genes and we found okay fine this is a housekeeping gene which is working better for me I should take it out okay. So we had observed that and we have certain publication also showcase that the data which has been generated once validated with other technology has been failed because those housekeeping genes were actually not normalizing the data perfectly right. So, we know all these challenges, so NanoString actually is working on these challenges has came out with a platform which can do or which can minimize the errors or the challenges which we have uh, in the existing three different technologies. Okay, so now if I introduce a NanoString technology in one line I can say it is an enzyme free direct digital detection technology. Enzyme free, I am not using any enzymes, no RT, no PCRs, direct digital detections. Means I am directly counting RNA molecules, my pro sequence is going to hybridize, detect and count. So it is a digital counting. 
Now you can mention the pain you are having with respect to enzyme processing and other stuff in fact, right? And here what we are doing, we are actually detecting the RNA molecules directly without any modifications. So that's important considerations, right? If I talk about the workflow, just four pipetting steps and 15 minutes of hand time, time is required to do the experiment over here. So I mean, so any errors which can be happened because of multiple steps also slow down over here. Yeah. So ma'am, it was. But so the reason is that, as ma'am mentioned already, so I'm coming to the point. So it works with the bad quality samples. Bad in the sense because you know, if you are not using any enzymes, that means if there is inhibitor also, it's not effective because enzyme is inhibited by the uh, by the contaminant which we have. Right? It's not there. Secondly, which is very important again, that we are not focusing poly on our kind of concept. Our probes are basically towards pipeline end, right? So even the sample is partially degraded also, that's not a challenge for us because we are not talking about polyate. So no polyate in chip concept and no enzymes are involved. So even we can work with bad quality, bad quality in the sense, even you don't need to do an RNA exception also. You take your cells, use analytic buffer, lyse it, apply the probes, they will bind and count. Because there's nothing, no enzymes means there is nothing like that that we need to amplify much. So no challenge. And simple data analysis once because once we get the data also we have we need a solution which can do the analysis perfectly. And as I mentioned, housekeeping genes, which is very, very important. So what we say is that let's don't compromise with the housekeeping genes. If you have 10 housekeeping genes included, otherwise the panel which we offer already have 15 housekeeping genes. Once you get the data, check your housekeeping genes. And based on the uh, stable expressions, based on the coefficient of variations, you select those and do the normalization of your data, which is very, very important. So these small, small, minute things actually affect your experiment a lot. And already there are certain publications which showcase. And the technology has been used globally a lot. And I would say, uh, regarding the multiplexing, the technology is not a whole transcriptor kind of concept. It is the technology which is applied once you have the information from NGS or micro experiments. You take your data and do the validation and, and other stuff in fact. Let's see what we do. It's important to understand what how the technology works. And that's the charm of the technology. So let's assume we have a target, gene number one, any gene, it can be from any any bacteria or any species. So it's a target. We design two probes for that. One is capture, one is reporter probes. Both are 50, 50, 50 basis, right? Okay. So what is going to happen? These two uh, probes is hybridized to this uh, uh, to this target and make, and make it tri complex. It's happening during incubation time. Now you can ask me how we can do multiplexing for different targets. And I mean, it's 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 it's, it's not uh, you know it's not clear to me that now what I will do in fact, right? So what the technology does, in fact, so let's, it's a G number one. For G number one, we are putting four color beads at six positions. We are putting four color at six positions. So that's the pattern for G number one. For G number two, we are changing the position of the beads. So likewise, we can make permutation combination of the beads positions and that defines your multiplexing power. Straight power. So you are doing multiplexing without enzyme, it's going to hybridize. And in the eyes of the camera, when we get the data information, the system only sees that how many the which beat pattern is present and how many times it's present. Done. Your experiment is over. This is the science behind this technology. Very simple, very straightforward. Four color beats, six positions. If the beat position change, gene changes. Because this beat pattern is specific to a specific target. Yeah, so at a time we can go up to 855. So, so when we have already pre-designed this beat pattern, so what we will do, we add, add, add this beat pattern to the specific targets you have. So pattern is already defined. So if you say 4 is to power 6, I mean that's a permutation combinations. 4 is to power 6 goes to 4000 combinations we can create. But uh, two dies, Two beats we can't put together, like blue color uh, beats we can't put together. So uh, officially we have thousands plus combinations, 
out of which we found 900 formulations are actually working the best i mean we can differentiate without any false positive false negative so 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 library in the sense when we have this beat pattern so beat no no so these are the probes these are probes we synthesize separately we just add this
And that's very important because breast cancer or any other cancer they used to uh, you know uh, just relapse a lot. So he got 496 genes now what to do? So initially he has done his home, own homework in fact and came out with the 50 gene, gene signatures. Now he was looking forward to which panel, which technology he should use uh, to uh, you know take this study forward for the IBD and FDA approval because you know when you are going for any approvals you have to run thousands of samples and you have to submit the data just to check out the sensitivity, specificity and reproducibility of the technology in fact. So he decided to go with the nano thing. There are few reasons which he mentioned in the article also. First of all, he knows that that's a technology which can work with bad quality samples. And when we are working with clinical samples, patient samples, we know they, are, they could be FFP samples, they could be highly degraded samples because after getting the biopsy, it's not easy in fact to get the samples in good quality. Secondly, the technology is very simple, straightforward. 20, within 24 hours, you are getting your data. I mean, anal analyzed data. Let's talk about analyzed data because that's the way the technology works. Upon. So, it takes almost three years, in fact, to do lot to this study, and he was able to, you know, submit the information and and uh, down the line, this this panel has been approved by uh, FDA uh, for routine testing for the uh, to identify the risk of a recurrence in fact for the breast cancer patients. So my intention is basically to showcase this slide is that if any information signature is available that can be translated into product, there is a protocol to follow, and the nano signature technology which can help you out in fact getting your signature validated and further down the line for uh, you know for uh, this to uh, you know develop into your product. So that's why this slide showcases that any information which has been discovered by RNA seq or microarray needs to be validation because validation always has to turn on an orthogonal or a different technology, in fact, right? So validation can turn on encounter down the line for translation. We can follow it for more number of samples, and finally we are end up with the product, in fact. So this is all about you know uh, the workflow which we follow when we are developing any product, in fact, or from the information which we are available with us. So few slides about infectious in, in, in immunology that what nano, nano string do have. So nano string initial days when the COVID was there, we have lots of publications came from nano string. And the reason was simple, straightforward, work, bad quality samples, lots of lots of reason in fact. Another reason was that, that we have very strong panel known as host response panel. That panel what, I mean, if there's infection happens from any infectious, I mean bacteria viruses, how our body responds to that, right? So there are certain immune pathways and you know genes involved with that. So what is happening over there, right? So that means the panel can be applied tuberculosis, what we are talking today, coronavirus or any other type of uh, you know microbial things you can apply. So yeah, and sample types as I mentioned, we are not restricted to any sample types. We work because the technology already is open to work with any type of sample type. So as I mentioned, that's a host response panel which actually gives the data within 24 hours. I'm already working some projects. We are on COVID samples from our country itself only, where we are just checking the uh, COVID samples on this response or host responsive host, host or host response panel, and just want to initiate to understand whether how the body responds against the infections, and that's very important. What are the pathways involved? What are the you know uh, things happens? Or we can compare between the samples between the patients in fact who had responded well, who had not responded well. In fact, so that's a very amazing uh, panel which has been used initial days a lot. Afterwards, when the sequencing has been introduced, a lot of things happens. It's a different story, but still, people look forward to run the samples on using this panel just to get the answer within 24 days. Instead of waiting for the days, and weeks, and months, in fact, to get the answers, here we can get the answer. Because another thing that is that the, the work has been already done behind the scene by Nanoski. They already curated and come out with this information. So instead of waiting for the things to come up, let's start with our experiment with the available panel. I don't want to explain in detail because you guys are expert for this that how the infection cycle goes up. So the beauty of this panel is that it tries to cover every phase of the infection cycle. So that's a, the, they try to mention that you don't have to worry as soon as the infection happens, the things started changes in the body. How it changes, which, which are the things changes in fact, they try to cover those things in fact. So that's the beauty of this panel in fact with the host response panel. We also, because when we talk about immunology, it's, it's very important to talk about immune cell absorption. What happens sometimes people are not responding and what's the reason in fact. And this is one of the big reason I've seen that uh, there we have lots of panels in fact. Frankly speaking for immunology, we have metabolic panels, we have immune exhaustion panel, CAR-T panel and all in fact. 
But this is something seems to be interesting because once we the host response panel, we also want to study that what exactly is happening inside the cells with respect to the immune cells. In fact. So try to cover the maximum genes, 70 to 50 panel, maximum pathway so that we can look out what is happening inside the uh, with respect to the immune response. I mean, whether the immune star cells are dysregulated at what stage, where and what. Stage. So panel will be. So if we talk about encounter, what encounters do have for you on or nanos you do have so we have lots of things available with respect to the different stages on infectious sites panels are readily available you can go to the website and see those panels details we can share you down the line if you require and uh, these are some immunology panels which is already available in fact on nanos so i mean a lot of work has you know, has been done with respect to immunology and infectious disease okay Another very interesting, so encounter you have seen is a very simple technology, right? It's work straightforward, right? There's no rocket science over there, but it's very useful because it's answering many things and it's minimizing the challenges which you have in routine exercise in, in routine level three to five. So let's talk about another technology which is very, very interesting actually. And this technology has, in fact, is playing a very important role to understand the heterogeneity of your tissues in fact, right? So, we all know GPS, Global Positioning System. GPS is helping us every day, everyone's life in fact. Okay, we are going to unknown place, GPS is going to help us to look at the place, right? Similar, so the same concept your nanoskin has tried to exploit over here and they just try, try to exploit at cellular and molecular level. What is happening is that the tissue is very, very important, right? Okay, that's a picture just to showcase that how the things are moving in genomics. So initially we talk about mixed fruit juice, smoothie, we can make it, mixing everything together. That's the way we are doing expression analysis, right? But the information we are getting is, over here's average information, remember. So, considering the fact the science start uh, uh, move further in fact, in 2012, we have another technology which is known as single cell RNA sequencing. This is again a great technology, single cell. Here what we can do, we can study the single cell profile. We can uh, get to information one, cell population, which types of cells are present. Secondly, what is it happening inside a single cell? It's great, but it's not answering all the questions. Another question was that, that for doing this study, I have to dissociate my cells. I have to get single cells from that. That means we are losing the position from where this cell belongs to. And that's important. You understand cell locations, cell abundance, the cells talk to each other, cells communicate to each other and that's very very important to understand if we actually want to understand the heterogeneity of a things, of, of, of neurobiology or even for infectious disease. After infection what is happening inside, it, inside the tissues, right? Which pathway it's affecting, which gene is going to be on and off, that's very very important to understand. So this is where nanostin comes into picture where we can see without breaking anything, without getting average information, I can pick out cherry or berry, whatever I like to be, if I am interested to look into that, or I want to taste it out, right? So this is how, uh, sorry, this, uh, our technology is this, DSP. Yeah. Simple slide, showcase, one patient is responding, one is not responding, I, we have done the uh, whole transcript analysis, no changes, we find it out. Same patients, study, perform. Same patients, they look out the specific location of the tissues, they found huge amount and that's why I'm saying position matters. Cells positions means a lot in fact. And we have lots of examples already there available with respect to the uh, tumor biology and neurobiology in fact. So how, so uh, let's talk about the technology in fact, how it appears in it, what the geomet actually is. So it's actually a combination of two worlds, two best technologies. When I say RN, RNA-seq and microRNA, they are highly multiplex. Multiplex means we can study thousands of genes at the same time. But the, at the same time, they are not spatial. I mean, we have to extract and do the things, right? Where is IHC? You heard about IHC? It's a routine exercise in all hospitals, pathology centers everywhere. This is a great technology with respect to uh, identification of the uh, proteins in biomarkers. But the problem is that it's, it's low flex. Only two, three targets you can study at the same time. So if I have 20, 30 targets, sorry, I have to repeat the experiment with, with, with serial fractions again and again and then to get the information, right? So another, so it's not, it's high plex, but it's not special. It's low plex, but special. 
So we combine both the things together. Now we came up with the technology where you can study uh, whole transcriptal level of profile. It's n counter limited to 855 genes. But now we extended our horizon to whole transcriptal. So we we have taken the power, or I would say we have taken the positives of both the technologies. It came out with a solution known as DSP split form, which can be used for uh, tissue analysis. And let's see how we can do. So this is the same slide. I can even understand that um, if you want to have more biology, uh, you need more sections, low plex, whereas uh, single sections you can study the whole transcript. So, okay, so sample time is not limited. I mean, we can do coronary biopsies of lung tissues or any other tissues in Finland. I just mentioned the name, otherwise, it's open in fact for it. How the technology works? Simple, just take 10 minutes of yours to understand how the thing works. So, we take the tissues, we just apply the imaging radius. Imaging radius are nothing, it's like staining. But here staining are different because we are using antibodies labeled with fluorescence. And those are cell surface markers. Right? So I can use three different antibodies and DNA staining dye so that I can visualize the entire tissues. Because just to look out something, I need to switch on the lights. So here the lights are the staining dye. Cyto 13 which look out the entire tissues. And if I want to look for specific cell type, I need a specific cell surface markers or antibodies labeled with the dye. So basically, the idea is the imaging region is going to visualize your tissues completely. And now we are profiling. Profiling agents are those targets you are looking forward for a biology, right? It can be targeted uh, uh, gene panel or it can be whole transcript. Okay. So how my technology works? So this is I'm talking about the uh, targeting regions. We have an antibody. So suppose I'm doing protein profiling. We have an antibody which is labeled with a uh, DSP barcode. So it's a 62 base sequences which is uh, required for lab identification and identification for many things in fact, so that we can discuss later. It is attached to the antibody with a photoclavial linker. So that's for protein profiling. For RNA profiling, what is happening? We are having a, uh, you know, complementary port sequences which is attached to a DSP barcodes and which is attached to a photoclavial linker. So the uh, why photoclavial linker? Because when we call UV light over here, this cleaver, uh, this uh, linker will be clean, and we can get the barcodes which we need to collect it. In fact, so that's the technology. So again, so these are the two reagents we are need, we just need it. So let's see what is happening inside the uh, machine. So what we do? We take the tissues. Tissue can be any. Uh, again, I'm telling you, it's from any in any species until unless we have the proofs available. So we currently we are strong in human and mouse. Maybe in the other species, we will uh, you know, dive into the other species as well. So we have the stained uh, slide with the, all, the, all the markers required and we take the slide and put into the system. So we, this is a uh, DSP platform from NanoString where we uh, put the system, uh, put the slide over there. And what we can do, we can select different regions of the tissues. Now take the tissue. And now based on the uh, on this morphology markers which actually are uh, specific to specific tissues uh, sorry cells cell types is uh, it's, is already uh, is already visualized so what we can do i can select any regions of my interest i have selected some region of interest then what's going to happen now i will apply uv light so remember the chemistry when uv light falls the barcodes released those barcode release will be captured by the system using the microcapillary which is already the system, right? So what is going to happen? So the system will collect the barcodes from one by one from each of the regions in fact. So this circle is a region of interest. So suppose this is my region where it is important with respect to the infection or anything you can say like, let's say simple language, I can say tumor cells and immune cells. So here we have tumor, here we have tumor, immune cells, tumor, immune cells, any combination we can think of. And what we can do, we can select those regions. So this selection is choice of ours, right? We can select any part of the tissues, follow the UV light over there, those barcodes will be released, collected, and this step will be repeated again and again, again and again, again till we are able to collect all the regions which is interested for us, in fact. Once it is collected uh, by the system into a 96 microdata plate, we take it and go for either for sequencing or illumina, or we can go for or, uh, on our uh, nail counter platform. Uh, which can be low plex in fact and then after getting the uh, information we go back to the software and do the analysis in fact the best part is that for analysis we are not depending on any other party we are having our own pipelines in fact to do the analysis in fact so overall this is how so interesting is what this is the tissues any tissue you can say uh, here i can quote for a tumor tissue so here this this region number 10 is is the population of tumor cells. So this is how the tumor cells is 
have a high average population tumor cells. This region is specific for immune cells, so this is how the immune cells are looking like over here. Right? So this is how we can select the regions in the entire the tissue. Right? Now you see that how much flexible I am with respect to the selections, because once you know the tissue, I, last week I was there for one of the experiments, it really uh, looks amazing. Your tissue is colored, colorful tissue you are seeing now, and you see lots of information is available. How to, you want all the information to extract it in fact. So how to, do, that's very important. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, sir, on the tissue itself, so we take the tissues, we apply the antibodies, uh, label with the specific fluorescence, like, yeah. No, 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 not in the animal model. It's it's on the tissue itself, only we are doing it. So, this is, I mean, this is important if, if you are working the tissue samples. Uh, the idea is that you can study, uh, you can select the region based on the circles, squares and polygonal because tissue always anti-symmetric. This is interesting. Why? What I can do? I can select a region and from that region also I can select specific populations. I can select CD, uh, CD4 or CD45 or macrophages, 68 and like this. I can go for specific cell type also like CD3 here. Uh, I mean rare cells. This is gradient features. From the cell, uh, from the boundaries, I can go up and down and collect the different regions just to understand the signaling pathways or any other information which you want to have it. Or I can go simple grading and look out the region if I want to do deep analysis of that specific because I don't know anything, I want to explore the entire world. So I can do that. So, I mean, this I've already explained that I can make different compartments from its tissues and study them. That's one. Amazing for inflammatory bubble disease, this is a structure, so we have different tissues. What I can do, I can segment, I can classify it into different uh, cells and then I can pick the cells of my interest. So instead of looking out the things, I can look out my mast cells because mast cells are responsible for that, for the disease in fact. Likewise for the uh, brain tissues, so here I am interested to work on astrocytes. So I can select my specific regions and pick out the information over there, so those things we can do over here. Limitation of time, so we can also work with specific organs. So instead of making human at left, let's talk about spatial organ at left. So already study has been done, we have done, uh, you know, so like it's, it's a uh, structure of kidney. So from different structures of the uh, subtypes of the regions of the kidney, we can make the um, whole transcriptome approach. And uh, this, I'm not doing it for few more applications, I'm going to go this one. And uh, so again, uh, like infectious, it's already. Uh, study has been done where the people want to understand what is happening inside. Getting the sequence of the genome is one information about what, what exactly is happening, what's the clinical outcome, how the response of the body, why people are responding differently. It has to be understood at the level and those things can be studied if you have such kind of technology. I understand the fact that here, here we need uh, the sample type will be difficult to get it but there, these are the technologies here we can explore the world that what is happening inside, which in our situation or of in actual, actual situations. So, outcomes are great for this study. They have identified lots of lots of targets. These targets can be used for the down, down, down the line for developing therapies and or developing biomarkers. In fact, so uh, I will not talk about because already running short of time. And uh, last one, important. We are talking from DSP over here, but now we are moved to single cell in spatial space, right? Not only single. Space, we can also target the nucleus. So we can also go to the subcellular level where we can target nucleus, mitochondria or other regions, subcellular cell, space. So this is how the things are moving with respect to nanostring. From encounter for bulk to spatial, that's how the uh, nanostring is placed in fact. Thank you so much for your time. It was too long in fact for the presentation. Anyway, thank you.
Baker, a technical application specialist, Thermo Fisher Scientific India, and Mr. Vijay Gupta, senior product manager, Thermo Fisher Scientific India. They are going to talk on tuberculosis lab, conventional and novel approach towards testing and identification techniques. So I hope I am audible. So good afternoon everyone. My name is Vijay and we will be talking today about tuberculosis lab, conventional and novel approach towards testing and identification techniques. So a little bit about our company, Thermo Fisher. So our motto is we enable our customers to make world healthier, cleaner and safer. So these are some facts about our company. Detail since we have a very limited time. We have different brand under some of Fisher umbrella. So, applied by system in, in vitro gen, Fisher scientific are among them. Uh, again, some detail about our company. We have different brands, different products, chemicals, equipments, uh, you know, consumables under it, different sub brands, and again, many products. You can see some of the products which are used in laboratory. Uh, so regular products, biosafety cabinets, pseudo incubator shakers. Now the topic comes about biosafety labs. You know, so important is since we will be handling myobacterium tuberculosis, which is in which is an infectious, uh, you know, organism. So what kind of lab should be designed? You know, what kind of risk group lab should be designed? And what kind of biosafety should be used? What kind of air ventilation should be used? So we will understand in detail that how should we handle, you know, and if we are doing testing, uh, depending upon which we are planning a moderate risk or a high risk group lab, what should be the lab infrastructure which should be utilized. So one of the picture where you can see lab operators who are working under the biosafety cabinet hood, uh, hoods are of different types and, you know, many of the people they do handle cell cultures or infectious agents. Now the important thing to understand and learn is about containment, you know, so that's very basic things but very important to understand. If you are planning to build a type of lab wherein you will plan to handle this group different um, infectious microorganisms, so what kind of, uh, what kind of laboratory should be used and how the risk assessment should be done. So identify each biosafety lab, uh, define containment, what is containment, uh, list the terms associated with the containment, identify protection provided by the equipment types, uh, principle of biosafety in terms of, uh, you know, types of biosafety labs. So it is classified in, uh, into uh, BSL 1, 2, 3 and 4. So the lab, uh, the grading happens when you go up, you handle like a risk group of microorganism which is having a community risk. So it should be handled in BSL 4. So uh, this is how the grading happens. And the guidance is given, well given in CDC. So you can also read through, even it is also given in WHO. Now containment definition is a safe method for managing infectious agents in the lab. Purpose is to reduce or eliminate the exposure of laboratory workers and outside environment to potentially hazardous agents. So how you are safeguarding operators who are working in a different uh, biosafety laboratory? How you are uh, uh, you know, making sure that your sample do not get any first information? And how you are making sure that if you are working with a very high risk infectious agents, and your air, laboratory air is going outside. So the people, the community should not be, uh, you know, communicated with the disease. So how you are making it sure? So this risk assessment is one of the important parameters. Now primary, primary containment, when you make sure that protection of personal and the immediate laboratory environment from exposure to infectious agents. So this is accomplished by good microbiological techniques and use of safety laboratory. So you can see the person operator who is working so he will be working uh, with a biosafety cabinet and he will be wearing all uh, pressure suits, you know. So that could be a, a positive pressure suit when someone is working in this group 3 and so, uh, uh, you know, lab. Secondary containment is when you are protect, uh, protecting the environmental externals to the laboratory from exposure to infectious materials accomplished by combination of laboratory design and operator operational practices. So we will see in uh, detail so how the risk assessment is done. So basically, in context of laboratory uh, biosafety, likelihood, likelihood is important. So likelihood refers to the potential for any exposure and or a release outside of the laboratory. So these are basically the terms and definition which have been taken from WHO and it is important to understand what it talks about. Consequently,
consequences is again a terminology which refers to the severity of the outcome from any exposure. So if you are handling any microorganism, what is the consequences if it gets exposed to an operator? How it, com it will it communicate? Either it will transfer to a community or not. So this could include a laboratory associated infection, asymptomatic carriers, environmental contamination, spread of uh, disease to the surrounding community or other illness or injury. So this is where you can see the laboratory biosafety uh, biological agents and infection to the individual, individual or community. Now that's again the WHO framework of risk, risk assessment. So it, tax, it talks about uh, gather information, evaluate the risk, so develop a risk control strategy, select and implement the risk control measures, review the risk and risk control measures. So this is important and critical when you are designing a laboratory and you are planning that you will handle certain uh, microorganisms which could fall in different risk group, uh, right? So I, in the next few slides, I will be talking about the different risk group of microorganisms and its risk classification, so, so that you can relate to it. Like you see in this chart, so I have uh, mentioned type of biosafety laboratory, BSL 1, 2, 3 and 4 and associated type of microorganism which should be handled in this type of laboratory. So you can see uh, risk group 4 is the highest communicable microorganism which is having highest risk and it is uh, infectious to high individual and high community risk. Wherein risk group 1 is having a no or low individual and community risk. Similarly, biosafety lab 1 is suitable for risk group 1, 2 but when you go uh, to risk group 2 and 3 and 4, so you can see the highest risk group 4 should be handled in diesel laboratory and so on. So this chart basically gives you an idea that which kind of microorganism depending upon the community risk or depending upon the individual risk should be handled in which type of biosafety level. Now that's again a, a, a picture demonstrating a typical standard biosafety laboratory where you can see uh, it's a well maintained GMP laboratory where in person, sorry, yes sorry, I see that. So you can see uh, by, they are maintaining a biosafety cabinet with proper thimble ducting to the outside so they are not releasing any of the aerosol which gets generated while they are handling any infectious samples and also people who are working in the laboratory are wearing all suits, proper protection suits. So that's the typical uh, you know, lab design for a particular and this is a biosafety level 3 lab wherein they can handle a highly infectious microorganism. They, they can even also handle a COVID uh, you know when they are doing a culture kind. Now that's again a classification which tells you and gives you an idea that what kind of labs and what could be the relative biosafety cabinet. So you can see BSL-4 which is the highest uh, lab in terms of you know you can handle a risk group 4 microorganism. So you can handle, you can work with a class 3 biosafety cabinet or a class 2 biosafety cabinet with a thimble ducting. So on in a BSL-3 uh, one can use a class 2 A2 biosafety cabinet with a thimble ducting. So high risk laboratory, so you can see the design wise, you know, if you are building a high risk laboratory, how your ventilation should be done, right? Uh, either you should have a natural convection or you should have a coarse convection. Whatever the air you are releasing from the lab should be, you should pass through the filter and goes out of the environment, right? You should have an access door. If you are having a BSL-4 lab, it should be in a separate building or a separate facility with an access control, right? So these are certain things which I have listed if someone is designing or planning highest uh, BSL-4 lab. So these are the things uh, should be considered. Now we all know uh, myobacterium tuberculosis is classified in this group 3, uh, level 3 and uh, even countries list, uh, all the countries list it under this group 3 level. There are certain, uh, for the TB specific biosafety guidance, uh, there is again a separate guidance by WHO and again Generally, three processes are being followed for diagnosis. That's the smear test. That's the first one. DSP is the one, uh, second test. And third is when you are manipulating the high culture volumes, right? So this is when the risk assessment is done depending on all these three processes and then lab design is being done. Right. Now you can see uh, procedures. So I said sputum test, DSP, and then when you manipulate the cultures and all. Right? So then we see the relative risk of person who are working in laboratory, uh, chances of catching the disease by And load of materials, viability of TV vessel, likelihood that uh, manipulation required for each procedure are prone to generating infectious cells. So this chart is self-explanatory and gives you much of information about the TV and uh, uh, likelihood of uh, handling this in the bicycle. Now again, as I said, uh, for TB also there are three types of lab which are recommended. Low risk lab when you are doing a smear test, moderate risk lab when you are doing a DSC or high risk lab when you are 
manipulating the culture. When you are manipulating the culture, chances that you will release, chances of releasing the aerosol, you know, or infectious particles are more, right? So this is where you see uh, when risk assessment comes. So for a high risk TV containment laboratory, high risk of generating any infectious aerosols from the specimens and high concentration of infectious particles, right? So activities also are relatively defined for this. Sput of this, we all know, so it's a very, very old technique and the load uh, varies from 0 to 10 to power 3 to 10 to power 4 in this sputum system with a scanty spinal grinding. Uh, sputum test, you do not need a high sophisticated lab, you do not need a bicycle laboratory, you can do this procedure in a clean mixture itself. Right? But when it comes to the DST, uh, right, you need a proper bicycle, you need a proper uh, BSL laboratory, you need a proper ventilation, you know, with a HIPAA filtration. Similarly, for when you are handling the cultures of your process, right? So it means you are manipulating the cultures, right? And you are releasing a lot of aerosol. So you need a defined by safety class 2A2 with the proper ducting to the outside so that you know whatever the things air gets released into the environment should be deprived. That's again a safe and gene expert test, which is I will not go much in detail since we have short of time and Nilangi is also waiting for a turn. And that's again, uh, you can see this is widely publicly available domain, uh, uh, you know, standard which is available. You can also download this. And if you want to know, understand more about the TV and disk assessment and types of biosafety lab, maybe it will give you a more understanding. Right? Low risk lab, you can see the air changes 6 to 12, recommendation is 6 to 12 air changes per hour. Directional airflow, as I said, natural or me mechanical ventilation is okay since it's a low risk lab. Proper disposal, and again, uh, when we are disposing something, it is has to be considered. Right? Similarly, for moderate risk lab, so again, you can see the centrifugation and piston manipulation should be done. Closed window, window should be closed, close. directional airflow should be there, and a certified biosafety tablet should be used when you are uh, doing any activities in moderate risk lab. Centrifuge, again, uh, important uh, instrument which are uh, being used while you are doing uh, you know, activities and detection uh, for thick tuberculosis, right? So there are three parameters which should be considered temperature. So you should use one refrigerated centrifuge, choose the right adapters and also contamination should be considered. So that's the centrifuge which are basically recommended and then fixed and the loaders are also recommended for this. High risk lab, that's again, as I said, it, it, it engages a lot of aerosol and infectious uh, agents. So manipulation of liquid sus suspension when you are doing must have a TV containment lab with restricted access. So that's what I said. Highest risk lab should have a dose with access control. So should understand who is going in and going out, right? Air flow into the lab with a recirculation, 6 to 12 air changes per hour. Sealed windows, all work must be performed within a certified by safety cabinet with the timber distance to the house. That's again uh, understanding of how air flow happens inside the by safety cabinet. So it gives a product uh, protection in terms of cloth contamination operator protections, you know, and also to the environmental protection. So this explains well, since I do not have much time to explain it uh, in very detail, uh, you know, so I hope this will give you an idea. Timber A to BSC again, by safety cabinet, but it should be timber ducted to the outside, so that you should not release any of the air inside the lab when you are doing any activity in high or moderate risk lab. And that's a typical uh, layout when uh, you are handling TV, uh, TV cultures. So basically, how should you place, uh, you know, the vortex, or how should you place this card container, parcel tubes, you know. So that's the typical recommended layout. So we do have good service capability. So I'll not go much in detail. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to Nilangi because Nilangi has some interesting stuff to, you know, uh, carry forward. So Nilangi, over to you. Thank you so much.
make the topic interesting and also wrap up. Uh, and thanks Vijay for uh, letting us know the importance of the biosafety cabinet because we are talking about uh, tuberculosis, which is the most infectious diseases, and there are some uh, novel and uh, advanced uh, techniques that I'll be covering in my talk, uh, which are simple for you guys to incorporate in your PhD thesis and your normal workflow as well. So as we all know, uh, the infectious diseases, it is caused by an external agent and it can be a carcinogen, virus, bacteria or even the other parasites. So we all know that it disrupts the vital body processes. But what is uh, important uh, is that uh, this thing, it stimulates the immune system either in the positive way or in the negative way. If the immune system uh, gets too much of uh, inflammation kind of uh, release of substances such as chemokines and cytokines, that can be harmful for the body. But the same cytokines and the chemokines which can be protective as well for containing the pathogen or any infectious agent. So there is a very vital interplay between the cytokines which are inflammatory cytokines or the anti-inflammatory cytokines. In case of uh, TB, of course, uh, there we will see a lot of such things which are required. Um, of course, I will be coming to that, but before that, uh, from Thermo Fisher, we have a complete portfolio for protein detection, right from protein isolation, protein purification, single protein detection like ELISA, multiple protein detections uh, in the form of uh, bead-based assays which can be read on the Luminex platform. Uh, because when we are talking about uh, any kind of uh, inflammation, there are a lot of substances which are released. So one cannot just think of a standalone cytokine or a standalone effect. It has to be in the multiple. So there are a lot of cytokines which come into play and one needs to look out all of them at a time instead of detecting or uh, looking at them at a single level. So we have multiple protein detection techniques. Um, we also have a flow cytometry platform which covers very well the cellular aspect of the uh, infectious diseases that is the cellular immunology part, identifying cell subsets uh, by, uh, by using the fluorescent antibodies. We also have a complete set of western blotting which is displayed outside so please do visit our booth. And of course we have antibodies which are the most important thing in all your experiments. Uh, whether you are doing western, whether you are doing flow or whether you are doing any in tissue uh, uh, culture or etc. So that is about the offerings that we have. So let us come back to the uh, tuberculosis thing. So I am again, I am basically uh, coming from immunology background and I would really like to talk about the cellular and humoral immunity. So when it talks, when it comes to TB, there are cellular immune responses there are humoral immune responses and there are adaptive immune responses. So all these are actually, uh, the cytokines are at the base of all these immune responses. So we see that alveolar macrophages are the one which get involved instantly and from there uh, the cytokines are released. So macrophages display antigenic structures on their cell surfaces and then they attract the T cells. The T cells in release the inflammatory cytokines, the cytotoxic there is a cytotoxic T cell response. So all these are coming into uh, picture and the alveolar uh, tissues which are residing inside the lung, there is a complete inflammation going on. So you have heard about the cytokine storm syndrome, right? Where have you heard about it? COVID-19. So we know that the excessive cytokines are always harmful for the body. So uh, those things uh, have to be uh, controlled. So we know that there is a complex interplay of all these cytokines and all these can be looked at on a single platform that is multiple cytokines or multiple proteins can be detected in the single way. So he talked about uh, handling uh, the infectious diseases in the biosafety cabinet. Sure. Yes. It is more of... And yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. But it is more originated from basically one cytokine that is IL-6 which was at the heart of all the pathways. Yes, that is still unknown. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. But I think TP, IL-10, Gamma is the most important cytokine that has been studied very well and TNF-alpha both. And then one needs to know whether we have, we have been seeing this kind of cytokines, which cells are secreting this cytokine. So, of course, the flow cytometry platforms come into the picture at that time. So, we have the attuned next flow cytometer, which uh, we have some brochures.
pictures outside, you can come and see those things. <laughs> I think we have uh, so Dr. Sangeeta ma'am who can answer your questions and we'll definitely talk about it. And I have introduced some slides on advanced flow cytometry. So let's uh, cover quickly the existing platform. So our talk is on traditional and advanced. So these are our traditional immunoassay platforms. ELISA is still the gold standard method for quantifying a single protein because there is no matrix interference. Yeah, then you can detect single protein without any matrix interference. Uh, we also have, un we have uncoated and coated ELISA platforms. The coated ELISAs are the most validated. You don't spend time in standardizing, so they all come with a very validated protocol. We have something new called as ProQuantum and uh, of course this is the Procarta plus multiplexing where uh, you can measure multiple proteins simultaneously. You can study or detect almost 80 cytokines or 80 proteins in single well at the same time simultaneously. So uh, this is about, the ELISA is all about single protein detection, ProQuantum is about again a single protein detection but it's very very sensitive. So ELISA is about uh, picogram per mil level, whereas ProQuantum assay that I'll be talking about is at femtogram per mil level. And the uh, uh, good thing is that, or the novel thing is that it can be read on the qPCR platforms. So you can imagine an immunoassay you are doing on a qPCR platform. So we'll talk about it little more. So that's about the ELISA. I will not talk about it much, but do visit the official website because we have lot of offerings for cytokines, chemokines, uh, kits, uh, hyper, uh, high, high sensitive kits, etc. So more than 1000 ELISA kits are present in different species and you can also choose whatever samples you needed because uh, in CB maybe you will be having some unconventional samples like uh, sputum sample or alveolar lavage or bile sample. So we have ELISAs present for those kind of unconventional samples also. So this is what I am talking about the future of immunoassays, QPCR and multiplexing. So let's see, uh, so what what if your immunoassay work on your QPCR instrument. So you can imagine something you are, you know, trying to detect some cytokines and you are not able to get any results with your conventional standard ELISA protocol. What you will report if you don't see the cytokine, you will report the cytokine in the abstain. Right? Because, but maybe the cytokine is present, but it is not in the limit of your detection uh, technique that you are using. So ELISA is unable to detect that much low level of cytokine. But that low level of cytokine can be picked up by the proquantum assay because it's highly, highly sensitive. Uh, it reads at femtogram per mil level. And it uses a technique called as proximity ligation technology. So how it works? So you have a uh, you have a sensitivity coming from matched antibody pairs, and you have a sensitivity coming from the qPCR uh, technique. So this qPCR is Stackman-based chemistry, so it is highly highly specific, and these antibodies are again uh, highly paired. Uh, I mean the pairs are selected so that they identify two different antigens on the protein. So when the two uh, antibody uh, by the, I mean the two antibodies identify two different epitopes on the protein they come into close proximity with each other and then the oligos also come into close proximity with each other and there is a loop formation. Uh, the antibody complex is broken down at a very high temperature and then it is just your qPCR reaction. So if you see this graph where you see the CT values, the thresholds, you see high concentration. So the lower the CT value, high concentration. So you have proteins which are in high concentration, proteins which are in low concentration you can study the entire range with this platform. Uh, customization is also possible. We have, right now we have human mouse assays which are ready to uh, use. Uh -huh. So we have the 84 well, 96 well plate format also, but single protein at a time. But at a femtogram per mil level and this is very important. So 2 to 5 microliter sample that is very very small as compared to your ELISA which is 50 and 100 microliters. Yes, yes, yes. And again this is very interesting because you have real time PCR machines in your lab nowadays in COVID times. So it can be run on any qPCR instrument. So it is, these are open access. It can be run on any other instrument, uh, qPCR instruments. 
it's a industry standard level because it is giving you five log data sorry so this is how it goes basically i'm not going into too much detail but it's a tacman based chemistry so your uh, sensitivity is coming up from the tacman probes and your uh, specificity is coming up from the antibody well. so both genomics as well as proteomics we are more so these are some of the instruments uh, we have uh, hand instruments for the qpcr which can be used for reading this pro quantum assays and again coming to multiplexing where you have multiple targets to be quantified from small sample volume so profile you can profile more biomarkers in less amount of sample so nowadays biomarkers can be anything it can be mrna it can be protein it can be microrna right so this lumilex platform is actually used for detecting both protein as well as rna so this particularly i have highlighted protein multiplexing so as this is how you do the protein multiplexing you can analyze up to 80 proteins in a single well so similarly we also have contigen assays which can detect 80 genes in the single well the luminex instrument can do both the gene as well as protein based assay so we have some interesting brochures and information outside if you are interested we are there to help you so i am not again going into much detail because you all know how this is like similar uh, to elisa sandwich elisa platform so here the beads are color coded beads there are 500 different bead combinations possible each bead is from is different from uh, other bead in terms of color and 500 different combinations are possible that means 500 different analytes can be detected together so we have different instruments for matrix luminex 200 flexmap 3d so 50 200 to 500 analytes you can go up scale up as per your requirement so this is a very simple simple workflow that you all know so each bead can be conjugated with a capture antibody then you have a sample in which your cytokine may be present then you have detection antibody and there is a streptavirin p so these are the instruments which are detector basically or which will read your assays the fluorescence so we have the highest panel available currently wherein uh, premix panel where you can analyze 65 different cytokines in single well plus you can also customize your assays so now you look at this uh, picture where you see multiplexing versus elisa so when you want to have a look at holistic picture like what is happening at the multiple level uh, there you can there multiplexing can really help because you can compare this versus this and imagine the amount of data points that you get from single sample in single well so it is a very high throughput method it can be automated it can be run in a 384 well plate and very very rare biological samples can be handled right from sputum sample bile sample urine sample which are otherwise very uh, difficult to collect and they are collected in very small samples so saliva tear all those samples you can analyze so this is actually saving your labor saving your time and saving your money so this is really a very best solution when you want to look at multiple cytokines uh, at the same time for the your precious samples uh, we have very interesting formats available we have simplex assays we have uh, premix uh, assays which are validated ready to use and we also have a custom panel so custom panel means you have a liberty to mix and match you can mix from different pathways or from different uh, analyte so this is like two applications on one instrument uh, i have covered procaltaplex assays uh, but if anybody is interested in similar kind of rna quantification on luminex yes we are there we have the assays we have custom panels available so one single instrument at cellular level you look at mrna for the transcription level and you also look at uh, translational level on the um, like in terms of what proteins are secreted so both transcriptional as well as translational level studies you can do on single instrument that is luminex based instrument so very simple uh, method on how to choose or how you yourself can make your panel so so we you select the species mm -hmm. you select the assay you select your sample type so if you have any other unconventional samples you can select other Uh, then you select your instrument and just go on uh, making your choice so whether if there is any income
compatibility, it will be highlighted in red. But mostly, uh, you can combine multiple cytokines in single panel. It yes, it will uh, automate. It will notify you, and maybe you have. It is because of the different dilution factors. Some cytokines, such as RANTIs, they have to. Uh, you have to dilute the sample one is to hundred times. So when you dilute the sample, you will, you may lose other cytokines. So that is why we warn you. I mean, just so that you can make it a separate assay. Uh, this is now I am moving from uh, humoral immune response to the cellular level. So this is something which we have newly introduced, uh, high speed spectral cell sorter. Uh, it's very good for the kind of infectious diseases because uh, we just covered uh, what is the you know requirement for the biosafety level. So there is something very interesting coming up in this regarding to the handling of infectious diseases. So it comes with 9 lasers, you have 60 PMT detectors, uh, this is very interesting, integrated class 2 biosafety containment. So the instrument or the cell sorter comes with an integrated biosafety cabinet. So you don't need to you know go anywhere else, you can just work in this. You can do up to 70 colors fluorescence data which is the highest. So there are again interesting factors, I am not touching them in detail but you can always come to our booth. So sorting is very interesting, cell sorters use flow cytometry principles, cells are labeled with the particular fluorochromes and cells can be sorted based on the fluorochromes they are labeled with. So these are very sophisticated techniques, established technology, uh, it can be automated also, yes, so what else we have, we have six based sorting. So if you are working on something like stem cells or TIs, uh, or the precious samples, it's very important that you can sort them out. Rapid plate sorting, 10x faster, then it's the highest, it is having the highest full capacity for the differentiation of fluorochromes and again integrated biosafety cabinet. And this is my last slide. So why do cell sorting is required? Because um, I would like to tell you that uh, cells can be directed, directly collected in two 96 well plates or tubes or 384 well plate. The cells which are sorted are 99% pure and 99% homogeneous or like sorry and 99% viable. So you can collect them in the biosafety cabinet and use it directly for the culture. Right? So you can there and then set up your all culture experiments or any kind of downstream experiments because you are collecting almost clones or pure population of cells from the heterogeneous samples and you are working in a biosafety cabinet too. So that is very advantageous for the things such as if you are working on genome editing, qPCR, drug toxicity, cell therapy, protein expression, vaccine studies, for all these things, this is a very useful technology because you are getting pure population of cells which can be cultured, which have 99% pure and these can come from really heterogeneous samples such as TIs or other cell types rare cell types, stem cells, etc. Depending on the cytokines and cell surface marker, you can sort them out, make them single suspension, homogeneous and then go for your cell culture. So yeah, so that is my last slide, if you have any questions. So do come uh, to our booth and we have some interesting things here. Thank you. Relate the things, <laughs> yes. Actually, be yes, but because of the time stain, I didn't add many other things, but I think that was helpful. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, I'd like to thank our both these speakers who really, due to time constraint, keep their talks very informative as well as Chris. Now, in the last, I would like to invite Dr. Wei to present a memento to both the speakers. Dr. Nilanguri, please turn.
time for lunch served at faculty lounge area and we will assemble by 2:30 in in Imbalajila new building